Hey guys, Metal Jesus here, and we are going to talk everything about Def Leppard. Go through their entire discography. This is going to be awesome. Let's get rocked. You're listening to Discography Discussion, episode 232, Def Leppard with Metal Jesus Rocks. <laughs> wow. Okay. Somebody has been doing their homework, so that's good. <laughs> Hosted by Dan Terry. Joe's just ripping the scab off. And Joseph Wren. Let's go back to you with the boombox. Presented by DiscussMetal.com. And if you Armageddon it with a BFG and a super shotgun... Then you are ready for this episode of Discography Discussion. I am Joe. That is Dan. Metal Jesus Rocks is here. Hey, man. Thanks for having... Hey, man. Hey, mans. Hey, man. (laughs) Hey, man. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for having me on. I've been looking forward to this. I've been listening to way too much Def Leppard this week, both the good and the bad. So this is going to be... It's going to be a pretty interesting discussion. I'm looking forward to it. I'm feeling really good that you said that there's some bad because I was a little nervous about what I was allowed to say, <laughs> you know, uh, whenever we're going through it. Because, I mean, just like any band, though, when you have 11 records, there, there's no way that's going to be 11 home runs. Uh, there's yeah. just even, even when we did Iron Maiden a few weeks back, there were some albums that we were like, yeah, I'm not sure. You know, mostly it's good, but, <laughs> you know. There's always uh, there's always something to nitpick, but um, yeah, this is this is super exciting, and and it, this was definitely a this was a trip for me because I'm not used to listening to anything from the '80s. I'm, I'm, I've always been a '90s kid and on, and uh, Joe is slowly starting to open my eyes to, hey man, there were actually some pretty pretty good bands in the '80s. You just can't you can't go into it with the same sort of expectations that you have. Uh, with uh, with modern music. He's you know, not so. telling the whole story. He goes all the way back to the 60s and says nothing but good things about uh, Black Sabbath. I almost said Def Leppard. You can tell where my <laughs> mind is right now. He jumps forward to the 90s and I'm like, dude, you passed up the Motley Cruz. You passed up Def Leppard. There's some White Snake in there. Bon Jovi when Bon Jovi was rock. Like, there's so much good shit. <laughs> yeah, well, plus, and, and of course, like, you know, the early Metallica, which I assume you do like, right? Oh, yes. The early do, Slayer, yes. that's st- that stuff, you know. He's in denial yeah. about Metallica in the 80s being an 80s well, band. Even a, lot, <laughs> even, even a lot of the death metal bands that I like, like Carcass and stuff like that, that was all established in the 80s as well. Yeah, yeah. Napalm sure. Death, you know. Uh, so, yeah, a lot of the stuff that I like now, I can I can kind of thank uh, 80s bands for. <laughs> so. Yeah, well, well, as 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 we go through this, I mean, you're going to see that Def Leppard has definitely evolved over the, the years. Uh, some may like it, some may not. So that'll be kind of the interesting part about this video and this discussion for sure is talking about, you know, Def Leppard and all the changes that they've gone through. So <laughs> I'm going to ask you right at the top, Metal Jesus, in the 80s. There are those that talk shit about hair metal. Mm -hmm. I get it. It's easy to make fun of, right? But what was good about hair metal was interesting rock songs with pop sensibilities, right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, absolutely. Is it that that's what it was? I mean, there was definitely some cheese in there big time, especially towards the end of it. And, you know, I I live in Seattle, right? So we were part of the grunge era that kind of killed off hair metal. And so there was a lot of that going on when I was growing up and coming out of college where, man, it was not cool to like eighties metal in any way. And so for, you know, a lot of the nineties people made fun of it, but it's funny how it's kind of come around. And in many ways it's lasted longer than grunge has for sure. I mean, a lot of these bands now like Def Leppard, Motley Crue, all these, even some of the, the, the smaller bands, they're they're still touring. They're still putting out records, and they're still kicking ass. You know, so it's 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 lasted for sure. And I think you're, you've hit on it. There's great musicality in there, great songwriting. Um, you know, also people dig the look. Like you go and you, you look at those old videos on YouTube. You know, some of those Def Leppard ones, and it'll be filled with comments going, "Wow, this is the the height of looking like a rock star." You know what I mean? Dressing up, not. Like an outfit on, you know what I mean? It, it was it was a cool time for sure. I loved it. So the question is, is it Def Leppard's fault for what? For all the hair metal problems? For all the or- hair metal, pop, heavy metal sensibilities that came later. A lot of people that I've talked hmm. to 
blame Def Leppard because, yeah, it was rock, but it was pop, really, is what it was. Yeah. Well, I think we're going to get to that. I think I think as we go through the, the discography, we're going to we're going to have discussions about how their music changed over time and the recording techniques and some of the things that they did with the the you know especially. Let's put it this way: I think. I think Def Leppard and Bon Jovi, from an audio standpoint, changed how that music sounded for sure. Uh, they, you know, and we're going to get into it when we get to Pyromania that there are some definitive changes that happened on albums that really steered the course. I mean, you know, without getting too far ahead, I mean, the very first time I heard a heavy metal rock song on the radio, it was Casey Kasem's Top 40 Countdown, and Rock of Ages was like number five, you know, and that was being played along with journey and all sorts of other stuff at the time. But that was, that was definitely a band that kind of, uh, a lot them along with quiet riot for sure. Yes. Metal health at the same time was the first time any, I think that was the number, or I think that was the first time that there was a heavy metal album at number one in the billboard top, top 100 was, quite right so there's a huh. to answer your question there's a lot of bands at the time that sort of you know and rat round and round they was just like this it was just like this time where it was right for hair metal to come along and and introduce that sort of style and the music videos and you know the babes in the videos and all that sort of stuff it was just i i ate it up as a little kid man i loved it <laughs> it's too much for a seven to ten year old to uh to pass up yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yep. also van halen too you could you can make the argument as well like 1984 when that came out you know there's just so it was just i guess i guess what i'm trying to say is to put it all in def leppard i don't think you could really do that i think it's it's everyone at that time in competition with each other upping their game with you know the outrageous outrageousness of the tours and the outfits and the songs and the videos and all that stuff and yeah that, 100%. That's my answer. <laughs> no, that's, 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 <laughs> all culminating in basically steel panther today <laughs> bringing it all back home thank so, you for steel funny. panther I was going to bring, yeah, I was going to bring up Steel Panther that like there's still obviously, and I'm going to get into this too whenever we talk about the albums because something that I've been paying attention to is Spotify stats whenever I'm, whenever I'm listening to these records because I don't, unfortunately, you know, in, in case it's some kind of big secret, uh, I don't own every single record <laughs> that we talk about on this podcast. So there's a lot of times where I'll have to uh, go and listen to Spotify or, or <laughs> actually, I've actually subscribed to Spotify and, um, uh, YouTube music is what it is now, mm -hmm. uh, just so that I can get kind of a bigger spread. Because even e even if Spotify doesn't have it, they've posted almost every album that ever exists up on YouTube, and so I pay mm -hmm. for YouTube specifically so that I don't have to watch ads, so I can just yep. listen to an uninterrupted album. Uh, mm -hmm. Although the the speed on some of those albums is is, is sometimes suspect uh, because sometimes they speed it up or whatever to get around copyright oh, things like that. Yeah, but yeah, uh, that, that's annoying. There's been times where I've been like, yeah, I didn't really like the vocals on this one. They were too high pitched. And everybody's looking at me like, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, sorry. I, I didn't realize that. Um, but before we get into Def Leppard, we are going to uh, go into a few comments that we received on recent episodes. Uh, first of all, we had a comment on Facebook uh, in regards to our suffocation episode. Um, which just really speaks to the variety of the type of bands that we talk about on this show is how we'll go from suffocation to to Def Leppard, you know. Uh, but uh, Greg Mann says, finally having time to listen to podcasts again means I naturally started with the suffocation episode. Hearing that makes me realize that you all should cover another legendary New York death metal band, uh, the very band that literally coined the term slam. I'm talking about internal bleeding. Find me another band besides them and Dying Fetus that make just as much sense on a hardcore show as they do a death metal show. And uh, he goes on to explain why uh, internal bleeding and suffocation need to be kind of like categorized together. So I appreciate that. We definitely have internal bleeding on the schedule, but uh, I, I don't want to be a liar and tell you we're going to get to it right away. We've got so many bands, so many, so many suggestions from listeners. Uh, it's turning into one of those things where uh, we're, we're going to get to everybody eventually. <laughs> but uh, it's I'm a good probably problem to be, have, man. Yeah, I'm going to probably <laughs> be 70, 70 years old, 75 years old before we before we really get there. Um, over on Apple Podcasts, we got a five star review from Bald Man Rich. Thank you very much, Richie. Um, he goes, my favorite podcast. I first discovered this podcast just as a way to kill a subway ride when I found a review on one of my favorite bands, Ale Storm. 
uh, ever since then I've been in, I've been so invested. Dan and Joe know how to turn a podcast into a welcoming community of metalheads. They have a discord and Patreon, which allows us to always stay in contact and speak my mind. Uh, I also once every month look forward to the hangout where we all have a blast and I've now made some good friends. Uh, thank you very much, Rich. We love hanging out with you every month on the Patreon hangout. Uh, last time we did it, we did Jackbox games, which were just ridiculous. I was downstairs screaming and laughing so hard at the computer screen and my wife was like, what is going on down there? Like, why, why, why is he, why is he screaming and laughing? Like he doesn't have that much fun whenever we're watching TV or doing family things. Um, and last we got a email from Jimmy. Jimmy says, hello, I'm new to podcasts in general. I'm 34 years old. And I just recently started diving into this world. I think it's so overwhelming, but luckily the one podcast I found that I keep returning to is yours. Uh, I really enjoy hearing you guys talk about bands that I love, but also discussing bands that I've never heard of. Uh, I also want to submit a list of bands that I would love for you. To, that I would love for you to possibly add to your queue. I wish you guys talked about EPs, but I totally understand why you don't. Uh, I checked to make sure that they uh, haven't been done. And I apologize if I missed any. Uh, and then Jimmy left me a list of about 20 bands. Uh, I'm not going to read all of them right now, uh, but there is one that I do want to talk about uh, and that he suggested morbid angel. Uh, we do have a Morbid Angel episode that is recorded. It's in the books. You guys haven't heard it yet, uh, but it is coming out. And uh, we did that with Scott Mellinger, the guitarist of Zeo. You guys all know is my favorite band. So <laughs> definitely, uh, definitely check that out when it comes out. Thank you guys for emailing and, and, and commenting and sharing episodes. I've said it a million times before. I love it whenever I share an episode somewhere. And my post gets deleted because one of you guys has already shared it. <laughs> so again, it's uh, like Joe said earlier, it's a good problem to have. Uh, and, uh, and I definitely appreciate it. So uh, keep that going. But now, now's what you guys are really here for. You guys didn't, you guys didn't come here to hear me talk. We're going to, we're going to turn this over to Mel metal Jesus and say, metal Jesus, tell us about Def Leppard. Let's get to the sparkle lounge. <laughs> Wow. Okay. Somebody has been doing their homework, so that's good. <laughs> well, before Metal Jesus leads Dan and I into the Sparkle Lounge, I'm going to take this time to say thank you to everyone for listening to the podcast. Thank you for listening and for subscribing. If you are not a subscriber, then you can find everything Discography Discussion at DiscussMetal.com. We are on Spotify, Apple and Google Podcasts, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher, iHeartRadio. So if you have an Amazon Echo or a Google Home, you have no excuse. Ask it to play the latest episode of the Discography Discussion podcast, and it will. We're also on Facebook and on Twitter at Discuss Metal. Be sure to like, favorite, and subscribe. It really helps us out. It lets us know you're listening. And now Dan is going to tell us all about five-star reviews. Well, we do love our five-star reviews here on Discography Discussion. Uh, like my friend Bald Man Rich uh, left us a five-star review. And uh, you can do the same, and we will read it on the show just like we read his. And I would also love to take this opportunity to shout out our beloved patrons. You guys are the ones that keep us afloat every single month, and uh, we appreciate you, and we appreciate hanging out with you once a month. And who are these Patreon subscribers? Well, I'm going to tell you who they are. We've got Lost Fiction, Kyle Driver, Timu Rantia. You nailed it, dude. Uh, maybe I did. I don't know. We'll see. Let us know whenever we get it perfectly right. Uh, we've got Dangerous Dave, Ryan Rowe, Richard Renz, Big T. Big T. We've got Josiah Heiberg, Brandon Miranda, Ken Zapla, Tantalized Fungins. Best name ever. Jeremy Prince, Josh Moser, David Brown, Samuel Woodward, Brian Dean. It's me, comma, Brave. <laughs> Lance Alligood, the king of metal. Alexander, Patrick Aspland, and Jeffrey De Los Santos, the actual Mac. Thank you guys so much for your contributions every month. We really appreciate you, and you guys are largely why the show even still exists to this day. So thank you so much. I mean, I don't know if I necessarily have like an official, you know, history of Def Leppard or not, but they basically started many many years ago he mentioned eps so i'm just gonna i know we're not gonna officially talk about this one but this is their very first album right here so this, oh, is, the Def awesome. wow. this is the Def Leppard EP. yeah so and actually in all fairness this is, is actually a reprint from um uh record store day a couple of years ago okay so, the, okay. so Def, Def leopard actually is very active in record store day which is pretty cool actually Def leopard's really active in 
in re-releasing and doing a bunch of merchandising, which I, is, as a fan, is a lot of fun. But anyways, getting back to, uh, um, you know, Def Leppard as a band, I mean, the influence of them through the 80s is just, they were one of the top five rock, you know, hair metal bands of the era. And, uh, you know, we were talking a little bit about sort of their influence. And yeah, for a lot of people like me, you know, being a young kid, hearing them on Top 40 radio for the first time, when we were used to hearing not quite as heavy stuff was life changing. I mean, I remember the time I heard it for the first time on the radio that Utah Gleaton, Glouton Globin, you know, <laughs> yes, <laughs> just sort of, you know, it was, it was cool. It was epic. And it was, it happened at that right time. They were in the right place at the right time. Um, obviously that wasn't their first album right there, but you know, they just hit when MTV and radio and, uh, you know, it was ready for them, and um, and I guess they came. They technically came out of that new wave of British heavy metal. I think that's kind of what they're often associated with initially, you know. But they quickly evolved into something more and something bigger than that, and and transcending that. And so, um, yeah, that, that's that's kind of my synopsis. <laughs> well, I have to I have to say they're the most American sounding British band. Mm -hmm. um, that I've heard uh, in my life because I didn't even know before we started started whenever we decided to do this episode I, I didn't I wasn't entirely sure where they were they were from so whenever it turned out that they were actually an English rock band mm -hmm. uh, it makes a ton of sense especially considering the new wave of British he British heavy metal uh, and all of that you know like I said we talked about Iron Maiden a few weeks ago and so whenever we whenever we start with their debut album uh, in 1980 on through the night um this guy oh yeah you got it too yeah <laughs> um uh, whenever we get to on through the night this is where i think this is probably their most um their most metal album uh as far as like being what people would consider to be traditional metal without without kind of mixing in a lot of those a lot of those other styles because i would consider for the most part def leppard to be a hard rock band um yeah and so, you know, I was actually really surprised by this whenever I listened to it because I don't think I heard anything before Pyromania, you know, um, prior to doing the episode. So I was actually really, really surprised by this one as to how metal it actually was. It was a little bit more in line with like your Iron Maidens and, and, and Saxon. Iron Maiden was a lot more extreme as far as being a little bit more like punk. This this even on their first album and this could just be because i listened to the remastered version uh but it, it's not raw like some of those uh early um i you know i'm, I'm thinking back to like diamond head and, and bands like mm -hmm. that, that that came out kind of around the same time uh and this already from the from the get-go has a sheen to it <laughs> that that a lot of these other bands didn't have so like this record really um i actually enjoyed this one quite a bit it was a, it was a great way for me to get started because I'm not going to lie, I wasn't really looking forward to listening to all of these, and this record definitely got me started on the right foot. Because I was like, "All right, I can, I can, I, I can chill with this. I like this." And um, I mean, songs like "Rock Brigade," "Hello America," uh, "Rocks Off," you know, like it was cool. "Sorrow Is a Woman" too is an extremely important song uh, for them, because in my opinion, it's almost like a blueprint of what they were going to kind of go after as far as them always having kind of those i don't want to say a power ballad because it doesn't really start that way but it, it definitely it definitely gets to that melodic space that the band was kind of known for generally speaking this album is not the def leopard that we all know i don't know yeah. what the catalyst was that gave us this pop sensible power ballad like you said i mean when i heard def leppard for the first time i'm pretty sure it was pour some sugar on me so i get it they had to get there but this sounds more like classic judas priest to me or yeah. saxon like you said this is not the same def leppard that we've been hearing now for 40 years yeah so yeah this is a really interesting album and and it wasn't i don't think it was very popular at all you know, I think most fans like me discovered this album after we already liked Def Leppard. And we kind of went back and I know initially when I heard this, I'm like, what? This is such a weird album. You know, <laughs> it's, it, it's it's such a it's such a first band's album where you're like, oh, OK, this is a little rough compared to their new, you know, the stuff that they would do. But going back now, I like it way more than I used to. Like like you said, Rock Brigade, Hello America are classic songs. This album has one of my favorite riffs of, of any Def Leppard song, and that is Wasted. 
Oh, that yeah. Just, yes. That is such a simple yet killer riff that I just love on this album. Also, too, this has a song, and I think it's the uh, the When the Walls Come Down, where it's got that very cheesy 1970s, early 80s, kind of like, in the first world of the first... It's got this like guy talking in the beginning. Yeah. In the... <laughs> In the atomic wars, and you're just like, what the hell is this song? It's so, this is so cheesy. It's so bad, but it's it's pretty fun. So I I dig it. The limit we live in so society. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it, it's an album where I wouldn't definitely consider this part. It's not part of my top five Def Leppard albums, but I, I appreciate it more going back. And actually, uh, as we get closer to Hysteria, Def Leppard ends up going back to this album in a really cool way. And so I'll talk about their live shows when that okay. when we get closer to, to uh, a little bit later in their career. Yeah. I mean, I heard this and I was like, wow, these guys are like a metal band. Like I, you know, mm-hmm. it was a little bit like, man. So, and, and it's funny because like, there's something about 1980 where you're going to be either a band that sounds like a throwback from the seventies, which they are a little bit on that record. Um, or, you know, they're going to go in this heavier direction. I know thrash wasn't really a thing. I think, I think the heaviest music that was there in like 1980 was probably like speed metal. I know the speed metal was like going to be the big thing before thrash. Um, and it just kind of like got completely run over by thrash. Uh, so it's like, are, you know, are these guys going to go and are they going to take the metal thing and, and make it heavier and go in a more extreme direction? And uh, they did not. Uh, and that's fine because <laughs> yeah. I think that I, well, because the, so it, it's easy to, it's easy to trash a band. You know, for because um, th- this is something that I've been thinking about while I've been doing the episode and listening to the albums, is it's easy to trash a band for changing. I think that's the, I think that's the easiest, like most basic thing to trash a band for is like, well, you don't sound the same uh, as you did on your first record. But I think in the case of Def Leppard, I think they would have run into a situation where they would have sounded like every other band that came out at that time. Uh, and this record is probably, you know. It, in a lot of ways, they're most generic as far as sounding like a band from that time period. And you can kind of see their influences uh, on their sleeves. And so I wonder if like some of the metal elements were just like, well, this is what everyone's doing right now. So we're going to do it too. Uh, Whereas whenever we move into their next record, High and Dry, this is where you kind of start meeting the real Def Leppard. 1981. He's high and yeah. dry, but he is trying very hard not to be. <laughs> Such a weird cover, isn't it? I know, it's so bizarre. This this album here is what a lot of old school Def Leppard fans consider to be their best album. And I, I'm i not there. I think this would probably be my number three best uh, Def Leppard album. I think it's a fantastic... Let's put it this way. I think this album takes what they did on their first album and you can see where they're going, like the production. I think this is the first one where they work with Mutt Lang, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So that I, you see Mutt Lang's influence on this album big time, I think, because you know he is a guy who is not just a producer; he's a he's a molder of bands, and he definitely is starting to to you know uh, push his influence a little bit here. But I. I mean, we we go through these songs. I like so many of them. High and Dry, You Got Me, Let It Go, Another Hit and Run, Lady Strange. Um, Actually, some of my favorite songs on this album are the last two on side two, which is uh, uh, Mirror, Mirror and No, No, No. Those are pretty rocking tunes that are pretty cool. Uh, The other thing I want to mention about this, too, it's kind of cool, is that do you guys know what a lock groove is on a vinyl record? Unfortunately, yes. Okay, so so <laughs> this album has a lock groove on that no 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 part where he's like no 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 <laughs> it, it just goes oh, on wow. forever forever, <laughs> 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 which is really annoying. But it, yeah, it's one of those things where you know you, you, when you finish an album, sometimes you just let the needle spin at the end. There, you won't do that with this album because that'll drive you crazy. <laughs> oh wow, <laughs> yeah, that's that's that could be. Fr- I could see that being frustrated, but at the same time. If you're going to have a lock groove somewhere, yeah. that's the perfect place to have it because you just yeah. keep that going forever. This is the it song actually, that doesn't end. <laughs> right. Yeah. And actually they do two lock grooves because the next album has the lock groove as well, but it's a better one. So we'll did, talk did about they do it, it on purpose? Did they do that on purpose or was it just a, wow. Oh. 
Yeah, you have to do it on purpose because you basically have to do the run out and then and it has to be perfectly timed at the right, end right. in order for that to work. The the one on Pyromania is better because it's that drum groove. Mm-hmm. That whole thing, that goes on forever, but that's at least cool. <laughs> Somewhere right now, a vinyl collector is cringing like really hard. Um, <laughs> see, I, I actually got a record uh, recently from a band I love a lot that I've already mentioned tonight. Um, and they're they're they re-released an album from like 1998 and it was the first time on vinyl or maybe second time, but uh, it had a locked groove in it, but it was definitely not intentional. Uh, oh, it was really? also, it was also at a really awesome part too. Um, huh. But yeah, it was, it was a locked groove. What I ended up having to do is I got like a, um, I got, I got a, like a, like a, like a monocle that had like five or six. And I went in there with an X-Acto knife and I actually cut into the groove so that it would go to the next groove. <laughs> Oh, um, interesting. You brave well, man. Us- you can well, hear it, though. It, it makes usually a it's, popping sound. It Usually it's the last groove on the record. And so it's designed... Like, the Beatles very famously did it with uh, Sgt. Pepper. Right. If you've listened to Sgt. Pepper, the very end of it has a... Da, da, ba, da, 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 ba, da, ba. It, it did that as well. And that was in, like, what, 67 or something like that. But it's usually the last groove on an album. Yeah. Um, but anyways, it... I just want to mention that as a piece of trivia because because a lot of people will maybe listen to this on Spotify going, why does it do that at the end for like a minute? And it's like, yeah. well, they're they're emulating that part of the vinyl record, the original release. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool that they that they did that because even I was kind of wondering that as I was listening. I was like, why is that going right? on so long? It sounds like a record <laughs> skipping, but I'm yeah. but like I'm clearly at work listening yeah. to Spotify and I'm not listening to a record, right? So like, what is this? What does this mean? Um, yeah. But no, like I, I really like this record because I thought that uh, number one, I love the cover. Um, and for mm-hmm. me, sometimes even if I don't like the music that much, if the cover's awesome, and it's funny because I actually have this on cassette, and I wish I would have grabbed it uh, beforehand. Uh, but I have this on, I have this on cassette, and I never even noticed until we were doing this episode that there's no water in the pool, uh, and it makes so much it makes so much <laughs> sense uh, with, with high and dry. It's just that a dumb, sense. yeah. It's just a dumb. It's just something dumb that I did not really observe. <laughs> whenever i was doing it and i was like man what is my problem here like come on uh but yeah i was like now it makes perfect sense but yeah i like this record because like it actually is in a lot of ways a heavier Def leopard and i and i think that's i think that's more to do with them having much better production value um having you know like a, the first record had a sheen for sure but it almost sounded a little too clean at times mm-hmm. and i think almost unintentionally whereas i think I think the riffs hit harder on this record. They ring out longer. There's more, there's more almost like room noise in them. Like they, they feel powerful. And that's something that, you know, we're going to get from now on to the point where it's almost going to become annoying, um, where they, they are such a guitar heavy band, um, which might sound ridiculous, obviously talking about a band like Def Leppard, but like, it's, it's like the most duh statement I could make, but like they are, one of the most guitar heavy bands. And that's actually what really attracted to me, attracted me to them on this record was that they really, really take it seriously at a time where there were other, there were other eighties rock bands at the time that the guitar was almost like a secondary thought. Like they'd just come in and play their little like three note lead part. And then, and then everything would drop out and it would just be drums and and yada, yada, yada. Uh, Def Leppard's going to get there. Uh, (laughs) But uh, on this record, especially, this is this is I feel like kind of the golden era of the be- of the band, the beginning of the golden era, where it's like they can they can do no wrong. Every song's a hit, you know. Every song is something that you're going to listen to over and over and over and over and over again. And um, a high and dry, I think for the for the quote unquote true Def Leppard fans out there, that's the record that you want everybody to start with. Yeah, and this wasn't a hit when it originally came out. It was only after Pyromania that was doing extremely well that record uh or the radio started playing bringing on the heartbreak which is off this album and then they remixed it or something like that for mtv um so yeah it, it took Def Leppard a little a little while to kind of find their their big moment for sure but I, I again this is an easy one for i think a lot of Def Leppard fans to kind of come back to yeah and rediscover and realize how awesome it is you know well yeah and i think i think all three of us can agree on this too that like as much as we like bands that maybe are, are more mainstream there, there's always this feeling when you're listening to a record or a band where something wasn't necessarily made to be commercial. It was made to, it was made because this was the record they wanted to make. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and that's largely how I feel about high and dry. I don't feel like there was anybody whispering in the ear being like, well, you know, if you guys did this, it would, it would be a lot better, you know, like that yeah. sort of thing. Uh, yeah. And so I don't hear any of that kind of corporate meddling that you're definitely going to start hearing later on. It's one yep. of those examples where, 
you listen to bringing in on the heartbreak and you think that's the moment that the executive said, we got to get a producer in here. These guys know how to write a song. We can do 10 of these for the next 30 years and <laughs> money, yeah. so much yeah. money. And we could pick on that all night long because we know record labels get involved with records. That's why it's an industry, not somebody giving you money to live out your dream. But how good is bringing on the heartbreak when it kicks in? Yeah. And, and I, 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 I was going to say, I, and I love speaking of, I love how it moves into a switch. What is that called? Uh, the instrumental switch six, two, five or whatever yeah, it's yeah. called. I love that. It's awesome. I know. I'm just listening to it now thinking I can't relate to that fan that bought high and dry and heard this for the first time, because to me, this is just one of the famous best Def Leppard songs. Mm -hmm. It's so good. It sounds raw in an Iron Maiden way from 1981, but it is so Def Leppard. All they got to do is turn up the reverb and put a few more layers on there. <laughs> and yeah. you've got the formula, guys. So, yeah, I kind of wish they had stuck with their more heavy metal origin. But if you've got that skill write a song and get people to sing along with it why wouldn't you want to do more of that well yeah and i think that that's the biggest thing that attracted me to kind of this band because i mean for all the for all the listeners of the show that really listen to us to talk about bands like opeth or arch enemy or you know those much heavier bands they're probably like what the hell are you guys doing talking about <laughs> def leppard you know but at the same time like what attracted me to them was how well they could write a song just themselves you know what I mean? Like is the, one of the biggest criticisms I give is like when a heavy band goes like in a more pop direction, I always say like, if you're going to make pop music, at least make good pop music. And Def Leppard could already do that yeah. uh, kind, of, kind of from the beginning. Uh, and so they, they had the chops to make songs that were going to be enjoyable. And that couldn't have been, that couldn't have been more evident on Pyromania. Oh, it's time. 1983. I know you keep putting up the album covers, but I, can't, I I'm, I'm holding mine too. I'm thinking about just letting you do it because you're. you're <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's just zoom in right here. <laughs> yeah, yours are your, yours are yours are better than mine are. So there you go. I'm yeah. gonna let you have it. Yeah. So this was the album. This is the album that put them on the on the charts. This is the one that introduced them to the world. And uh, a little side note about this album, and you guys probably know this, but I'm gonna mention it anyways that uh, I I took a. I went to the University of Washington for audio production. And in there, you learn how to mic and record out uh, instruments and bands and stuff like that. And part of that course was going in and studying how drums are recorded in the past. And it was really interesting because one night the instructor was, you know, he puts on John Bonham. He's like, okay, how do you think that was recorded? And we kind of listened to it go, ah, you know, it was probably a big room or something like that. And he put on, you know, some other bands, Neil, you know, Peart and stuff like that. And, uh, and, and then he played a uh, photograph. I think it was photograph. He's like, how do you think that was recorded? And it's, it was like, I don't know, because it's so freaking, it kicks you in the chest. And I remember this yeah. as a kid listening to on the radio. I was like, and he's like, this, this song changed the way that bands were recorded in the 80s. And I was, you know, and he's, he's a, he was an older gentleman. So, you know, he, he was able to talk to about how it was so influential, the drum sound. Now he's like, however, the reality is it's not a drum that it's actually a synthesizer and so what mutt lang did was he would record rick allen and then replace it with a synthesizer drum kick that was mic'd off of an amp so interesting yeah so and that's that still sounded real so it sounded real but it was giving but it was basically it was like it was like the perfectly mic'd drum at the time and it was something that that you just were not able to do unless you actually did it artificially and so when you listen to this album now that you know that you'll be like wow that definitely sounds like a drum machine but at the time it was so revolutionary nobody knew that you know first of all here's a metal band on the radio with a kick drum like that and snare and everything and basically everything was replaced except for the the cymbals or the crashes or something like that so it's a very interesting album for that reason it, it again it when you were talking about sort of like what changed metal uh sonically this album changed metal for a lot of bands, for sure. They kind of like how the uh, Dr. Feelgood album with Bob Rock 
you know, going on to doing the Black yeah. Album Metallica, people trying to chase those sort of drum sounds and those guitar sounds. This was one of those albums at the time, for I'm sure. I'm so glad you brought that album up. You'll find out why later. Um, I think okay. that, is that why everybody thought the Lars? <laughs> that why everybody thought the Lars was a good drummer for a while? Uh, is that like, yeah? Anyway, okay, see, when sorry. I hear this album, I look back on all the '80s tropey music videos where they've got mm-hmm. the hexagon drum pads and oh yeah i mean even rick allen did it at one point and i just thought that was the decision somebody made because we started with this and eventually we get to pull me under mike portnoy playing every single drum on that kid except for the snare drum apparently so i don't want to go back to dream what theater Come drove on. that choice back to dream theater. I'm, I'm more than happy to <laughs> it has to be just a decision to save money because look at how we record today now you can do everything at home and if you uh, want you can record an entire drum set that sounds more real than what you may have the budget to produce so 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 you think that that they were doing those those pads and stuff like that because you think it was cheaper because it, you know, rolling drum kits back in the day were really expensive. Yeah. Really? So, oh, extremely expensive. And so I think it was just my guess would be, of course, you know, I wasn't old enough to know, but I think it's just one of those things where people chase what sounds good at the time. They'll go, wow, how did that how did that band do that? Or what's that sound? You know, for me, when I think of those sort of drum sounds, um, Alex Van Halen had a similar style where he had, you know, toms that just sounded like nobody else at the time. Plus, he used a lot of triggered drum samples as well. And, I, th- you know, it could be part of their sound, but also I think a lot of other bands want to do it, too. Um, but I also think, too, that, you know, you would uh, you also have the opposite effect where people are like, hey, you know, like Rick Allen on this album and the next one is very famously complained because he was like, why the hell am I even in the studio if you're just going to replace me? You know, and uh I think he's got a point. You know what I mean? It's like it would be a very different album. This one, especially the next one, if if you know an acoustic kit was played. So and then the next album that would have been impossible. However, it you know actually you know that brings up a point here. So you know they started using synthesized drums on this album, which actually worked out in their favor when Rick Allen loses an arm. And suddenly the technology yeah. is there for them to do an electronic kit where he can play with just, you know, three appendages, which is pretty amazing, actually, the, how that worked out. And I love the story of that, no matter how embellished it may be for those of us that didn't live it. But if you look at that band and you say, through everything, they just stuck together. Yeah. Most bands probably would have just replaced their drummer. You know what I mean? And it it's to Def Leppard's credit, I think, big time that they didn't do that. That they they let him figure it out. You know, I mean, it's it's amazing. It, the, I love the story of that. It's most like drummers would have said, "I can't do it." Yeah, yeah it, it's the most wholesome story in in rock and roll. It really is. Like in the sense of like, if you if you want to work at this, we're going to give you the time to work at it. You know, and that's one thing that you know we're talking about these records that came out in relatively rapid succession, you know, but as time goes on, Def Leppard's going to be like, they're going to put a record out when they're ready, mm-hmm. you know? And, uh, and I think it's to their benefit in most cases there, there's a couple of things we're going to get to later that I'm going to have a lot of trouble uh, defending. Uh, but at the same time, like this is whenever they were like, you know, with, with Pyromania, they were, this is kind of like the world's introduction to Def Leppard in the sense that like, this is when they were getting the most radio play. This is when they were kind of, I don't want to say it's their peak because we haven't gotten to hysteria yet, but like, I think that like, really this is, this was most people's introduction to Def Leppard mm-hmm. or at least anybody that was really into hard rock. You know, um, I think that after hysteria came out, you didn't have a choice whether, whether you were in hard, into hard rock or, or not. <laughs> um, but mm-hmm. uh, the, you know, for, for the guys that were, that were hard rockers and just into stuff that, you know, was into stuff that was heavy uh, for the time and, and, and a band that, that cared a lot about about uh, about good like guitar like lead guitar work, um, I think that's something that this band does really really well. That I think a lot of people don't give them credit for. Everybody remembers the hooks, but people don't remember the solos. And I think the yeah. solos are are actually much better than what the band is giving credit for. Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, Phil Collin is is an amazing you know lead guitarist as well for sure. And I think the thing with me and Pyromania is that. Uh, I love the cover. I think this cover is iconic and epic and looks fantastic on a on a t-shirt. Um, and 
it has some of the best Def Leppard songs. It's, but it also has some filler too. And that's what's kind of interesting about this album is that I don't love it from front to back, but I do love definitely many of the songs on here. Uh, you know, all the ones that people know. I mean, Photograph, um, Rock of Ages, Foolin' is great. But I also really love Die Hard the Hunter and also Billy's Got a Gun. I think those two songs oh, are yeah. awesome. 100%. So, you, you know, you put out a record like Pyromania. How do you how do you follow that up? I mean, it's it's one of those records that you know everybody everybody loves. At least everybody that's into hard rock loves. Uh, and how do you respond to that? Well, you put out a record called Hysteria. Are you getting it, Dan? <laughs> are, oh yeah. Are you getting it? Oh, I'm getting yes. it. Yes. So getting I'm it. getting it. Dan. Yes. <laughs> I'm getting it. It's uh, this record, man. Um, I mean. What is 199,707,317 uh, Spotify streams mean to you? Uh, I think all of us as content creators would love to have uh, that level of numbers <laughs> on anything. Uh, this record obviously produced, spawned one of the greatest uh, mega hits uh, in rock music back then, today. I know that, like, you know, it's summertime, it's hot outside. If I go to a pool party with a with, if I go to if I, if I go to a pool party with a boombox uh, and I play this song, you know everybody's going to be my best friend, you know. So, uh, and of course, I'm talking about pour some sugar on me. Let's uh, go back to you with the boombox. Okay, first of all, I wouldn't I wouldn't be at a pool party, but uh, if I was, if I was, I'd be I'd, I would have a boombox with hysteria in it. Um, it only plays cassettes, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I have a hysteria cassette. That's fine. Um, you know, so that's yeah. okay. This record is, I'm, I'm of two minds about this record. <sighs> On one mind, I'm like, <laughs> holy crap. Like you guys blew it out of the water. You guys became, you guys went from being just a rock band, you know, just another rock band, a rock metal band. Uh, and now you're, you're, you're one of, if not the biggest band in the world uh, that year, because you've stripped your sound down. It's not as complex as it was before. But it's all about the hooks. You've you you you've strained out all of the other elements of your sound, and you've made you've made yourself into a band that literally just produces hooks uh, over and over and over and over again. Uh, and on one of one mind, it's like congratulations. I, I've said this a million times on this podcast. I cannot wait for my day to sell out. <laughs> you know, because I got a wife and kids and a and a house, and and you know, I I'd, I'd love to sell out anytime. Let's do it. It, it, it's like that song from Tool, right? Uh, what, which uh, hooker with a penis? You know? Yes, yes. Like, I, I sold out long before you. You know, mm -hmm. it, 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 yeah. That's yeah. I'm not. I'm not like some member of the hard rock ethos cult or anything. <laughs> like, uh, if a band wants to put out a record like Hysteria and absolutely blow the blow the blow everyone else out of the water, um, that's that's what you should do. There, there's no other. <laughs> there is no other. Uh, no other choice to make. And uh, they absolutely did this on this record. But on the other side of it, you know, the punk rock side of me is like, come on, guys. Like, you guys were a hard rock band. You guys stuck with that. This record is not as musically, uh, it's not, not as musically interesting as, as some of your previous records. What are you guys doing? Blah, blah, blah. You guys have all heard me make this speech before. You can go back and listen to the In Flames episode. It, it's a whole thing. <laughs> uh, but like, at the same time, at my, my current age, I, I really... I give in to the more positive side of it. I think this was the smartest thing that they possibly could have done. Everything sounds super loud. Um, the drums, especially e even the drums on Pour Some Sugar on Me are like the loudest drums. I don't care if they're fake or they're sampled or, or whatever the deal is. They are some of the loudest drums you're ever going to hear. And if you go and see this band play this song live, okay, it, the drums are going to be that loud, uh, yeah. if not louder. It's it, It's going to... It's gonna blow your mind, everybody. This is not the song that you're that, that comes on and you go and get a beer. You know, this is this is absolutely um, anything. Anything that they play off of this record is going to be absolutely a hit. Everybody's gonna go nuts. Everybody's gonna go crazy. And even if it even if it's not my personal cup of tea, it's not something that I'm just gonna put on. This is kind of that album that I go to whenever you know I'm driving in the car and somebody says, "Can you put on something that everyone can enjoy?" <laughs> This is what I put on, and I'm not I'm not disappointed with it. I think Hysteria is one of the best examples of what you can do. I would say in a lot of ways this is uh, their black album, you know, uh, in that they 
This this is where they became a band that everybody became aware of immediately. Well, their goal with this, if you read the, uh, I, I know there's a couple of versions of this of this album that has liner notes and sort of the story of it, and the story of it is that Mutt Lang, his goal was to make an album like Thriller from Michael Jackson, which was you know at the time. Michael Jackson had six hits off of Thriller, which at the time was just mind blowing. You right, got yeah. one, two, or three hits off an album that was considered a very successful album, and so he believed that with Def Leppard and Hysteria that he could make a greatest hits album out of a single release, and so that was their goal with this, and they got pretty damn close. Oh yeah, you know? absolutely. Uh, yeah, I mean they had six six singles released in the UK and seven in the United States. Before they finally just gave up, they actually wanted to put out another single, and they're and the band was like, "We're ready to move on. We're tired. We've re- been touring for two years. We're, we want to do something else." <laughs> when I started to pay more attention to the music I was listening to and not the songs that I was hearing, I was fascinated by how many of the Def Leppard classics just come mm-hmm. from Hysteria. Yeah, and Did, go ahead. Oh no, no, go ahead. For me, it's that point in the career where metal was getting ready to change if it hadn't already started Mm -hmm. but everybody let Def Leppard have it because it was their thing you want to blame them for the bad things that happened with hair metal I I don't care you can't write this many good songs and be expected to be more raw be less pleasant to listen to what had they gone through in the past five years Rick Allen lost his fucking arm and yeah. you get hysteria. Yeah. Wow. No, it's impressive for sure. I mean, again, looking back on that, it, it, it's it's just a testament to the band for sure. It, I love the fact that they worked that out and, and that the technology was available for him to do that. You know, he was just, that happened at a time when you could do, um, you know, drum p- pedals and triggers like that to to have a drummer with you know with the only one arm <laughs> pull it off, and and he continues. And actually, now Rick Allen plays an acoustic set as well. So he's, you know, he's an amazing guy for that reason, for sure. Um, th- the thing about when I look back to this album, a couple things stick out in my mind. For one, they made the choice in North America to release women as the very first single for this. And the reason why that they did that is because they didn't do that anywhere else in the world, only in North America. And the reason why they did that here is because the record label felt that women was the heavier song and therefore would appeal to the fans of their metal side. And I will tell you as a kid who was a fan of Def Leppard, when I heard that song, I didn't really like it. And I still think it's kind of one of the weaker songs on the album. I think it's just an okay tune. It's it's a roadblock to getting to the real classics on this album, which are, you know, as we mentioned here, it's like Animal, Rocket, uh, Pour Some Sugar on Me, you know, all these other songs. And so Love it's kind of bites. You know, so okay. I don't really like Love Bites. Only I think it's a really well crafted song. But honestly, actually, to be quite honest, I don't really like the ballads that Def Leppard writes. <laughs> I think they're re- <laughs> really they're so good though. They're, they're gonna have a bad time. So good uh, coming up. I, well, I know, I know, and absolutely, and you know, the, the truth is actually, I don't really like ballads that much at all. I mean, there's very few ballads I actually really like, and Love Bites is a song I'm I'm just I, I never liked it when it first came out. Uh, I still don't like. It's the only song I will skip on this album every single time because I'm just like. You know, my wife likes it. That's fine. You know, whatever. But um, we found the breaking point of Metal yeah, Jesus. <laughs> I, and, 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 and that's pretty consistent across all this. As, as you mentioned, they they go pretty deep on ballads in the upcoming albums for sure. But uh, but but anyway, so th- so when this came out, I was disappointed as a kid. I was like, God, women's weak. And then what's this other stuff on here? This is really overly produced. And it's kind of um, it just didn't sound like Pyromania at all. But what happened was is that I didn't hate it. And so I kept playing the album over and over. I played this album every single day for probably a year. So much so that my best friend was like, Jesus, would you just play something different? (laughs) He was so sick of coming over and hearing this album at the time. Because ultimately, I did love the album and it turned into one of my favorites. I mean, it's for me, it's, it's my favorite Def Leppard album by far. I can still put it on today. 
I still love it. I, I'm still, it sounds incredible. Like in a really, in a, in, you know, my, I have a really nice stereo in my car. Man, it fucking destroys the stereo system in my car. It's awesome sounding, you know? Yes. Um, plus, I also like, you know, some of the other B-side al- songs in here, like uh, Run Ride is a really cool song. It's a little bit faster. Uh, God of God of War, is that what it's called? Or, uh, I should Gods of War, I think. Gods of War, thank yeah. you. Where it's got the sample of... Uh, uh, Ronald Reagan in there and stuff like that. You know, I, I dig that stuff a lot for sure. I can't tell you how many albums I have that like I ended up loving them because of purchase justification, which is what I think is kind of what you dealt with with this record too. Is like you buy it, you don't necessarily dig it the first time that you listen to it, but you continue listening to it anyway because that's the record that you bought. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like you you could have yeah. picked you could have picked any record in the world, but you bought this one, and and so you kind of keep listening to it and. And it, it's probably the time in your life that you're going to be the most open-minded about music uh, that you've ever been, uh, because it's like, well, I, I bought this, I own it now. This is the new release that I have, and I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, I didn't really get to buy that many albums uh, in, right. a, in a quick succession. Uh, so you know, you you just kind of stuck with what you had, and uh, yeah, this record is a hundred percent a grower. Uh, because the first time I heard it, I was like, oh, God, what is this sellout stuff? It's back when I was listening to like Exodus and, and, and Slayer and, and stuff like that. So like I was I didn't have a whole whole lot of tolerance for something like like Def Leppard. But, you know, when you're when you're walking down the street or you're, you know, biking over to your friend's house or something and you're listening and, and you start kind of singing these songs to yourself and they because they, they, they've <laughs> they, they've wormed their way into your brain yep. uh in a way that that you know maybe a heavier band can't you know i love heavy bands i love death metal bands and thrash metal bands but sometimes sometimes those bands are interchangeable with each other you know yeah. and and um with stuff like def leppard it's like every song is kind of its own thing it, they're almost kind of a hard band to listen to a full record of because every song is kind of its own thing. They don't necessarily follow the theme of like, or they don't follow a theme really at all. Every song kind of has its own vibe. Mm. And that's the most apparent on Hysteria. There, There is two things I want to mention about this album, though, as far as uh, collectors and fans go. And so uh, before we move on, for sure. So I actually have three copies of, of Hysteria on vinyl. And the reason... Oh, wow. for- the reason for that is is because the original releases of of Hysteria is actually a really long album and so long that the that the original pressing of it actually is pretty poor when it gets to oh, the inner wow. groove. Yeah, I don't know how, how much you guys know about vinyl, but the closer that you get to the center ring, the actually the lower the quality of the audio yeah, is. And, yeah. Yeah, and so uh Hysteria is one of those albums where it is actually pretty shitty sounding. Uh, those last couple songs on each side because they just they're running out of room. So anyway, so they re- finally a couple years ago released the double vinyl versions of it on 180 gram vinyl. So that's what I have right here. It's about Most fans, fucking time. It, it really was a, lo- <laughs> a lot of fans like like me were were like, okay, guys, let, let's do this. I think it, it took vinyl coming back for them to kind of go. Oh, maybe people actually do care. Uh, the other thing I want to mention too, really quick is that Def Leppard did a residency in Vegas and where they basically for, I think, a week or 10 days or something like that, played Hysteria in its entirety. Oh, wow. Uh, um, Yeah, in Vegas. That's kind of cool in of itself. However, it's not the best part. The best part is that they were their own opening band. So What? So... Yes. So they basically on the on in on this DVD and Blu-ray, you can't really see it, but they basically play as their own opening band called uh, Dead Flatbird. And the reason why they did that <laughs> is because Flatbird. is because they wanted to play all the songs they never get to play. And so what they did is they came out. They, they didn't tell the audience that they were doing this. A lot of people were kind of like, "What the hell's going on here?" No pyro, no anything behind them, and they basically would play all the songs that they, you never hear them play, like "Wasted," like all the songs off of "On Through the Night" and "High and Dry," and plus also some of the B sides that they later did. And they did it in character of a band that's pretending to be a Def Leppard cover band. That's amazing. That is so cool. It is so cool. I mean, it's the only it, it's the 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 hysteria live stuff on this is fine. It's great as you would expect, but the dead flatbird stuff and their set list is every Def Leppard dream set list. It's awesome to watch. <laughs> they did two of them, so yeah, definitely check that out. I'll have to track that down. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I don't I have other bands that do DVDs. that. 
I need to get more. The only one I have, I think, is like I've got a couple, but I've got. I've, I think the only one that I really watch anymore is like the Death uh, Live and Raw, like uh, Death and Raw in L.A. Mm. And that thing is so old. Like I need to like I need to check out like a live DVD that has like really good production. <laughs> you know what, what you should do is what I do is whenever I go to we have half price books up here in Seattle, which is like okay. a, you know like a used. But anyways, and they always have like a uh, a live music DVD Blu-ray section, and I buy them there. Um, uh, you know, I just go through and I just pick up all the rock and metal stuff because they're getting collectible and expensive because a lot of the stuff is not on streaming. You can't get it anywhere else. And even though it's on, on DVD sometimes, and so the video is kind of low quality, the audio is almost always excellent on those. It's in like 5.1, yeah. Yes, yes. Or they'll have like a an actually uncompressed version of the audio. And so... Actually, a lot of the a lot of the live and you know music video stuff that you see on DVD is actually going up in price because you can't watch it anywhere else. Right, you know? not in that quality. You can watch it on YouTube; mm-hmm. it's going to be terrible. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 if it even lasts, if they don't give a copyright claim, right? Well, right. Yeah, that's that's always uh, the Reaper lurking behind anybody. Mm-hmm. Um, well, you know, speaking of the Reaper, no, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, whenever we whenever we this. move on to adrenaline, so like. Keep in mind, adrenaline hey, hey, comes hey, out. It's adrenalize. Nineteen ninety-two. Adrenalize. adrenalize. I'm flashing back to the Deftones episode. Um, adrenalize is, you know, it came out a solid. What is it? Five years uh, after Hysteria. I don't have this one vinyl. I can't show it. Sorry. That's all right. I, that's all right. I got you. I got you covered. Um, so adrenalize. Number one, like anybody that expected this to be a Hysteria. I mean, how do you? It's Hysteria you, Part Two. It yeah. is what they, they, they kind of tried to do the, the Hysteria Part 2 thing, I think, here. Um, I think that they largely failed. Yes, um, I would agree. <laughs> but, yeah, this is one of those hard things where, you know, they have a song called White Lightning, which I think is like, yeah, okay, you guys are trying to catch lightning in a bottle, uh, which is what they did with uh, with Hysteria. Actually, uh, I, think, I, I think White Lightning is a tribute to the late uh, uh, Steve Clark. I okay. believe I believe that song is is a dedication to him. Yeah, so I, I think mean, it's so a very it might, emotional song, but yeah. Yeah, and I think it might have riffs or something like that that he, he wrote before he died. I will say that Let's Get Rocked is a great opener. Mm-hmm. And it's what you, it's what you would expect, uh, I think, from a, from a follow-up uh, to Hysteria. The problem I have with it is just that, like, and it's not even that I have a problem with it, but this is kind of, this, is, this record's kind of a victim to times changing. Mm-hmm. The musical landscape, unfortunately, was very different in 1992 than it was in 1987, right? Yeah. Uh, and you've got Def Leppard here doing what Def Leppard does very, very well. well. I mean, fact, it's not yeah. that this is a bad, I don't think any of their records are bad. I'll say it like straight out. I don't think that they like, I don't think uh, they ever, I uh, uh, Wait till we get to the next one. Then okay, we'll have a discussion enough, about that. Fair enough. <laughs> fair enough. But I, I don't think that they ever like sucked. Like it was a point where I was like, oh my God, why would I even listen to this band? Um, and again, this is all from a 2020 perspective. Do you think I listen to any of these later day Def Leppard albums? If I, if not for the show, you know, like it's one of those, like, <laughs> you know, like I'm hearing these for the first time in 2021. So my perspective is a little bit skewed on that. You but missed out on the sparkle lounge, my friend. I didn't miss out. I listened to it. I listened to all of them, but like, this is definitely, um, this is definitely a step down, even though they were trying, I could see that they were trying to capture kind of that same glory, uh, that they'd had with hysteria. But I think, I think the problem is, is that when you get to 1992 and all the buzz has faded from hysteria, you know, who, who's left, who's left that's listening to Def Leppard. There are people. Uh, so I will say that, you know, this was an album that was probably designed for me. You know, I was a massive Def Leppard fan. However, again, I mentioned I was living in Seattle in 1992. This was not what I was interested in at all. Sure. I, I was, you know, I kicked in the nuts like everybody else with, you know, Soundgarden and uh, Nirvana and Alice in Chains and all that sort of stuff was, you know, coming up and taking over. And this album at the time, I didn't hate it. Like you mentioned, Get Ro- Let's Get Rocked and... It had some decent songs in here. Heaven is is decent. Tonight, White Lightning's, you know, it but it it just you could tell they're trying to capture that hysteria in a bottle and you're right. It's like it's not there. I maybe if the songs were a little better, you know, I don't know if this album had Mutt Lang on it, but part of me thinks he wasn't part of this album because he is a perfectionist. And I su- suspect that he probably would not have let this go out the door. I could be wrong though. I'd have to look. No, at it that. was my. It was Mike Shipley is the producer on this one. Okay, and it was I guess partially uh, produced by Def Leppard. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, I think the problem is it's just not cool anymore in 1992. I think that's that's one of the biggest things, and uh, and that's hard. And that's why I had a slightly different perspective of it. It's it's a lot higher on the list than I think it would be for most people that went through it. You know, when it was released, because I was like, well, this really isn't like that off base for for Def Leppard. It's not as good as the last record, but like, what is? It's one of the most successful records yeah. ever released. Yeah. Um, you know, nobody can really can really reproduce that. That you know load's not as good as the black album you know what i mean like it's just one of those things uh but like from a popular music standpoint this almost sounds like one of the leftovers from the 80s yeah like the industry knew that we were changing as consumers and music fans but who are your big names that you're not gonna mess with and def leppard is one of those names Right. I don't want Def Leppard to put out Risk in 1992. I want them to do what Def Leppard does. And for those people that only want that, hey guys, look over here. Remember the 80s? Remember how cool it was? It's still here. You can still buy it. And that'll be $22.99. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and, and I, again, looking back on this album now, I like it more than I did when it came out. Again, when it came out, I listened to it and bought it and it's like, eh, you know, and then kind of just moved on. I, um, and that was kind of a lot of the 90s, really, with hair metal for me and a lot of people is that there were these bands were trying to put out stuff. And you're right. It's just that in, in very few cases did you have an, al- an album that had that 80s aesthetic and still connect with the audience. It would take another couple decades for sure for that stuff to kind of roll back around. Yeah, people just did care, and I think that that's that's one of the hardest. I mean, obviously somebody did care. Like I, I, I love talking about my about my Spotify uh, stats. You know, I, for some reason that is important to me. Um, but I mean, some of these songs still have like 13 million, four million, mm-hmm. two million streams. So like, there are plenty of of diehard Def Leppard fans out there. But I think that like in 1992, this is just not going to hit the right way. People are are not going to be into it. You've got grunge kind of starting, starting, and and you've got um, you know just all of the alternative rock bands that came out. Everybody was was tired of the excess of the '80s, and that's why you know everybody says like, "Oh, Nirvana killed metal," which is a, a bullshit statement that isn't actually true, but maybe in the mainstream it's true. Um, but Def Leppard is a band that was firmly rooted in the mainstream, so they're going to show up with these hysteria esque songs five years later, and people are going to be like, "What else? What else you guys got?" Mm-hmm. You know, uh, the diehard fans, though, like when I bet when they're looking back on this album, there is a little bit more rose tinted glasses, and that like it is kind of admirable that they kind of stuck with their sound despite what the trends were. And trust me, as we go further in the discography, you're going to really wish that they had done that <laughs> for everything, you know. Uh, because after a while, yeah, it might be annoying that your band sticks with a very familiar sound. Uh, but after a few records and you go through a decade where this kind of music's not acceptable, um, it becomes endearing. And they're going to get there again. But like a- as we move on, this is this conversation's going to accelerate a little bit because I don't have a lot to say about each individual one. Um, and I think most Def, Le- Def Leppard fans feel that way is that like, there's going to be moments coming up where we're going to be like, what were you guys, what were you guys thinking? <laughs> yeah. So, um, 1996. Yeah. Okay. Let's slang. Just, Joe's just ripping the scab off. Well, you don't have this one on vinyl. <laughs> no, I don't. And, uh, you know, no, I don't. And it's, I think this, I think this is the only album, Def Leppard album I don't own because so you're showing euphoria here, but it actually is. It should be slang. Yeah, I realize that. Yeah, he really uh, doesn't want to talk about this album. He's not even showing the right <laughs> album. Yeah, yeah. yeah, a little too so, late. I heard slang. you say slang, but you really meant euphoria, right? <laughs> yeah, we're, we're gonna really. All right, skip fine. Ahead. We'll talk about slang. <laughs> there you so, go. Slang. You know, I. I'll be honest, and I'm sorry if this upsets people, but I I hate this album, and I, <laughs> I, I, I I listened to it back in the day, didn't like it at all. I uh, listened to it couple times this week to just make sure that I was, you know, solid in my, <laughs> my convictions and they're, they're hundred percent right there. I just, this is a, you know, this happened a lot in the mid nineties where bands were like, we got to do something different. We got to do something new. And, you know, and this is the result of that. I, this sounds like a band that is lost. It's, it sounds like a band that just needs like some espresso or do a line of Coke, man. It's like, it's so boring. <laughs> the nineties. 90s- so mid- 
had this weird relationship <laughs> with mid-range equalizers, electronics, and Europop, yeah. where we all just tried to create this dark, dingy-sounding industrial music. Trent Reznor did it, guys. I get it. Yeah. I would have tried to do it, too. But I don't think we needed Def Leppard to do it. In hindsight, though, it's kind of cool to look back and say, wow, you guys tried that weird 90s mm -hmm. loop thing with electronics and you're Def Leppard still, right? Okay, cool. Can we yeah, move I, on I, now? I think uh, they even had like a sitar in there and some other stuff and some chanting. It's like, wow, okay. They, <laughs> they tried it. With Adrenalize, they were like, yeah, we're Def Leppard and we're sticking to it. Mm -hmm. Slang is like, you know, like a 60 year old man walks out in front of your high school, in your high school gymnasium. You guys are all there for an assembly or something. And he walks out and he's wearing like a tie dyed t-shirt and like blue jeans or something. And he's like, how's it going fellow youths? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I understand what it's like when your parents just don't get it. You know, wasting like, away it, in Margaritaville. Yeah. It's <laughs> just, it's, it's that, that's all I hear with slang is, is this idea of like, you know, we stuck to our guns on the last record. It didn't do that very well. So we need to figure out what it is people like. Maybe this is them. Maybe this is the record label. I don't know. There, There's an entire, uh, there's a, on Spotify, you can listen to an entire commentary on this record uh, where they, I guess, try to explain it. I didn't listen to it because I just. Wait, Def Leppard after, is trying to explain it? I actually don't know because I didn't listen to it. But uh, <laughs> it was one of those things where. You know, th they released a deluxe edition of this. It's like two mm -hmm. hours long with like all these B-sides and stuff. But what I think is interesting is some of the B-sides are actually kind of good. And that this huh. is kind of what they landed on. And so it's one of those things where it sounds like a band kind of at war with themselves where they're like, OK, um, we want to do something that's going to appeal to, to, to a, a larger amount of people. And we did that with Hysteria and it worked really, really well. But now we can't use we can't use our same bag of tricks. You know, every band has a bag of tricks that they just pull them out every every now and again. And Def Leppard definitely had that, but now they've got to learn they've got to learn new tricks and it just doesn't work. Um the weird the weird kind of almost attitude to some of the vocals and some of the some of the uh instrumentation is just kind of laughable uh nowadays. And I find it hard to believe that it wasn't last laughable then. I think it I think it probably was. I don't think anybody. I don't think anybody's listening to Def Leppard uh, in 1996. I mean, maybe people are. You know, obviously, there's still millions of streams on some of the some of the songs. But um, so, I got hats off to the amount of diehards that these guys have. But like, this has to be rough. I mean, even even if you're a diehard Def Leppard fan, I can't imagine. I can't imagine you listening to this and being like, yeah. I mean, More, please. Supposedly, they do have the fans of this album. They've said that that, and I, and I I tend to believe that. I think that it depends on kind of when you come in on a band that maybe you connect with them. And so maybe in the '90s, some young kid in eight years old found this album and thought it was pretty cool and interesting. And you know, um, it reminds me very much of Kiss. Kiss very famously did something very similar to this back in 1980 or something like that. They they tried to do a prog concept album called The Elder. Oh boy, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, but I'm not. You know, no. Kiss, you know, saw it was trying to change some stuff, and so they did a a progressive rock concept album that is generally considered horrible <laughs> you know and, they, and you know and it's it, they got the guy who helped make the wall and all that stuff and to record it and but anyways that album was a bomb at the time and even now fans are like you know with a little bit of hindsight and a little bit of other stuff around there to enjoy people are like yeah the elder kind of weird but it's interesting and so, you know what i mean and so i think that that a lot of people with def leppard kind of come back to slang and go it's, you know, maybe not their finest hour, but maybe there are some nuggets in there. I know for me personally, the only song I can even listen to on here without, you know, horking my guts out is Slang. I think Slang is a, <laughs> yeah. is a actually up-tempo kind of fun tune. And so I, that's that's the one song I like. But See, Turn else. It Out is pretty good, too. I'm getting like a David Bowie in the 90s vibe. Like mm. the band should have just dressed differently and given themselves short amber orange hair <laughs> and made everything as dark as possible hired a guy to sit in back to be their dj and <laughs> just play slang like you could have gone to yeah. see that def leopard and it would have been hilarious 
So no, they would have yeah. played they would have played two songs off of slang and then played all the hits that you were there to hear. You Absolutely. Know? Like that's yeah. I mean, that's the only smart thing to do at this point. Uh it's and, weird, yeah, but I don't hate it. And it's hard that's to hindsight. To, it's hard to try to be cool. Like I get that. You know, um I lived it. I still live it. Um it's hard to it's hard to try to be cooler than you are or to be different than than what you are. Um, and I, as a music critic, um, I would say that like it's admirable that they did try to do something different. Well, and the nineties was the time to do that, right? Because they could mm-hmm. just make an alternative style rock album, which I think this is what this what I would call this. And you know, and a lot of bands tried that and didn't. I mean, most bands who are from the eighties tried doing something like this, yeah. and didn't work out. And they they basically just had to kind of hibernate for another ten years. And then do reunion tours. <laughs> I mean, who was the only who was the only old school band that did well in the nineties? Is, is Aerosmith the only one? And you know, Metallica, Bon, bon Jovi. Yeah. Bon Jovi did really well, and I don't understand it because I'm an old school Bon Jovi fan. I love Slippery When Wet and Fahrenheit seventy eight hundred and all those early stuff. And I don't, you know, I think it was Blaze of Glory got them through it, and it's my life, and you know what I mean. But somehow they yeah. pulled it out. Also, too, I think, and and I don't know how true this is, but I know it is true now that. You know, we're we're in America, right? We're in North America and our music, uh, you know, industry here is much different than the rest of the world. And so it's very possible that some of these bands just go tour Europe and South America for a decade. You know what I mean? Where maybe they they are still played on the radio or, you know, accepted, you know. Yeah, I mean, the best example out of this of that and it's kind of out of left field is Limp Bizkit, uh, Mm -hmm. who who, you know, Everybody just decided around 2002 that Limp Bizkit was not worth their time. Uh, and then Limp Bizkit just went overseas where they were very worth everyone's time. You know, and, and yeah. it's only now recently, I think I read an article on Metal Injection before we started recording, where they were actually showing live footage of Limp Bizkit playing live here in the U.S. And they have, a, they have a summer tour planned and stuff. So, like, it's all it's all cyclical, you know. Yeah. And we'll talk about that, too, how um, how this type of music, you know, eventually, yeah, it had a bad run in the 90s. But now this is the kind of stuff that people pay top dollars. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the, we went and saw them. We saw Def Leppard and Poison. I'm trying to remember. It must have been, like, mid-2000s. And I don't know. We paid, you know, too much. <laughs> sure. Yeah, of, course you, <laughs> of course you did, yeah. Yeah, but it was awesome. You know, they they acted like they wanted to be there, and honestly, Poison destroyed them. The uh, Poison's awesome in concert, and that sure. was a, yeah, and uh, you know it was great. But you know they they weren't playing the state fair. Let's put it that way. They were playing a real coliseum tour, and it was sold out and packed full of people like me who were kind of like, yeah, I'm, I'm into this. Let's do it. You know, right. Well, unfortunately, gentlemen, we are still in the dark ages. Uh, <laughs> You're not liking Euphoria. Really? I don't, okay. I don't love. Okay. <laughs> Let's just throw it out there. Okay. So, y- Euphoria it, is, and I couldn't get a high quality photo well, of it for some reason. L- l- let's talk about the cover for a second. Did, what cover? Did, yeah. Did they just, did Joe Elliott just get his like 10 year old nephew and his, you know, his brand new copy of Photoshop to make that? It's horrible. <laughs> it's not like, great. Hey, Dan, it, I've got a spirograph. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've got this lens flare thing. I'm just going to duplicate it about four times, and we're going to put the title. It's it's terrible. <laughs> I hate that cover. I it's, mean, it has the classic Def Leppard logo on it. Yeah, and that's about Mine it. I didn't have that. Um, but <laughs> That's true. <laughs> this album yeah. sounds like the mistake they didn't make in 1992. Yep. This is better than slang. Okay, I'll, it, I'll give it I that. This has better songs, for sure. I like, Actually, to be fair... Uh, I, this actually has one of my favorite songs of Def Leppard. It's Promises. I think that is a fantastic Def Leppard song. It could have came out back in the 80s. It would have been a mega hit for sure. Um, but also it's important to know that this song or this album and that song specifically was partially written by Mutt Lang. Okay. He is, he's the hit maker. Uh, he's the guy. I don't know if you know his his history, but he's he's a guy who... After Def Leppard, in between this, the, the reason why he wasn't working with Def Leppard because he's working in with Shania Twain, and he basically rocketed her to international stardom. So he knows how to record, how to write a song, and so he came back for a couple of tracks of this. And I think he was the executive producer. He, he ultimately signed off on it. So that's kind of why Def Leppard at this point is a little bit back to what they do best, you know. I would wonder what their comfort level was in playing the songs off of slang. 
and trying to mix those with the classic hits because that's got to be that's got to be a really really hard line to toe of like yeah here's this like newer modern more modern stuff um if they're gonna even give it that much credit uh, and then here's all the songs that you guys actually came to see, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and so I think with a record like, uh, with a record like Euphoria, you're, you're more, it's a much safer record, mm-hmm. uh, in the sense that like, yeah, they're not going to rock our world on this one, but they're going to, they're going to give us the Def Leppard experience that we, that we wanted. And, um, and I would say, I think it's their strongest. Well, let's put it this way. Looking at what we have left to talk about. I mean, this this is the last original Def Leppard album that I I really like. I, yeah. For me personally, I like Demolition Man. I love Promises. Back in Your Face is cheesy, but I dig it. Paper Sun is cool and heavy. That's a great song. 21st Century Sha La La Girl is fun. Not great, but fun. Uh, I think Disintegrate is the in- instrumental song on here, which again, was cool. To, Def Leppard was doing an instrumental song yeah, again, which I, I really that dig. Was cool. Yeah, yeah. Not a perfect album by any means, but I, I felt like, okay, well, I'm not going to completely write them off at this point. They are they can still do it, you know? Is this more of a classic Def Leppard record than Adrenalize would be in 1992? You know, I think if you... Uh, to answer your question, I would say it'd be awesome if they could combine the two. <laughs> side A, you, side B. There you go. Yeah. Take the best of both of those. Because, you know, one thing I've noticed, too, with Def Leppard, their albums get start getting a little long. Like, I don't know what, it, you know what I mean? Like, I, I kind of feel like some, this is a band that, again, that he needs a producer to knock it down to 10 kick-ass songs, not 14 with a, the filler. You know what I mean? And so to answer your question, it would be really awesome to, Take Adrenalize and Euphoria and mix those together. I think you would have a, an album that would be close to Hysteria for sure. I think I'm going to need Metal Jesus to make a playlist for this episode, Dan. What do you think? <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> this is how you need to listen to these records. Yeah. I think they're like, yeah, I mean, I mean, cut out a lot of the filler because I think that's my biggest issue with Euphoria is that it has a lot of filler. It has a lot yep. of like, it being 51 minutes long. This is when I started We're kind of reaching exhaustion because like so when i where i work i i I work on um uh ventilators like oxygen ventilators oxygen ventilators and and stuff like that and um and how that ties into having a problem with filler is that like when you're when you're testing on an oxygen machine you have to sit there and watch it for like 20 minutes and watch this like o2 meter to tell you if it's like producing oxygen the way it's supposed to be producing it Hmm. And that could take sometimes up to 20, 25 minutes. So like I'm listening to this Def Leppard record and I'm staring at this screen. And then <laughs> when I get, when I get, when I get two ballads in a row, I'm like, somebody's tapping me on the shoulder. Hey, you're awake. Like, what's, yeah. what's going on right now? You, you know, get up and do some jumping eight. jacks there, man. It's funny actually. Cause my, my headphones, I couldn't find them one day last week. And so I, I brought a portable speaker in with me and I was like, Oh, I'm listening to Def Leppard. Nobody's going to be upset, you know, the, that I'm listening to this. And so I pop it in and it was the same day that I had shaved. And so when I came in and I'm like sitting there at my desk working, listening to Def Leppard and, one of my coworkers is like, are you really you? Like, because your beard's, <laughs> your beard's gone. And I was like, what are you talking about? I'm listening to hard rock. And he's like, yeah, but like stuff yeah. That you usually listen to when you're working, like scares everyone. This like, is not the you- real discuss <laughs> yeah, metal, Dan. You- this is yeah, false, you- Dan. This is, this is hard rock. Yeah. This is discuss rock, Dan. You, you know, know like, little do they know you just got neutered that morning. It's like, wow. Right. It's so, you know, <laughs> right, <laughs> explains yeah, they all the blood. They had no yeah. idea. Yeah. Like, yeah. And all, all your testosterone's gone. It's like you're gonna you just get everyone hugs. Come here. I'm not even hug. I'm not even man <laughs> enough to be this guy's woman. Uh, but I think that like I think that like yeah, euphoria is just it okay, let's be positive for a second. It's a step in the it's the step in the right direction. It's yeah. it's it's the direction that they needed to go in. If you can't if you can't beat them, don't join them. Just keep doing the same thing that you're doing, and and hope that that, that people that are diehard fans are gonna are gonna get behind it. And I think largely, I think largely they did, and I think that the fans were there for it. Um, and this is where this is where it's like, oh yeah, I can I can buy a Def Leppard record now and not have to worry about them doing anything weird. Yeah, I definitely felt that way. I was like, okay, again, it's it's not you know they haven't created the masterpiece, you know, but there are five good songs on here that I still listen to today and I don't hate. I actually like them quite a bit. And they show up on their they, they've got a couple of Grace Hits albums um, and and 
Not surprisingly, my favorite is volume two. It, it includes volume two has a bunch of these type of songs on there that you're not sick of hearing, you know, and you kind of yeah. get to discover mixed up in the other stuff. It's pretty cool. 100%. Are we ready for X? We are. 2002. Another album I don't own. Man, you know, I, I, I love the cover of this one. <laughs> Yeah, well, at least at least it doesn't. It's it's a step barely above Euphoria. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, uh, this, it looks like it would be a rocking album, but it's the opposite of that. <laughs> it's contemporary top forty Def Leppard. Um, yeah, like when I when I look at a band like this, like in comparison to some of the other music I listen to, it's like so laughably poppy. And then you listen to a record like this, and you're like. Oh wow! Okay, that was not as far down as the rabbit hole goes. Like these guys, yeah. These guys can. These guys like you might be, you might hear some of these songs at the dentist office, yeah. you know. Uh, but I don't hate it for whatever reason. I, I I found this one to be kind of enjoyable, um, and I didn't fall asleep while I was listening to it. It's it's very it's a very like melodic kind of emotional album from Def Leppard. Whereas like I'm used to these guys, for lack of a better way to describe it, I'm used to these guys being fake cool all the time. And not necessarily being like a hundred percent honest about their feelings, <laughs> and and uh, and this record is is all of that. It's like it's like it's like the real. It's like the men behind the music uh, <laughs> sort of experience. And I I actually kind of responded to that uh, really well. It's a little long, but uh, you know I, I think if you stop maybe around like track ten, you'll probably probably be good. You know because this thing coming in at fifty six minutes, it's a uh, it's yeah. a little bit of a chore to listen to, but uh, you know, if you, if you take it in small doses, it's it's not it's not bad. Yeah, this is definitely an album that I think that could have been trimmed down to ten great songs or decent songs. You know, it's funny that I didn't I don't really like this album very much at all, but I get it though. You know, as far as you're right, it's a really well constructed album for sure. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of curious, you know, when you go on Amazon, you start reading reviews, and you know, I was surprised how many people love this album, like. Yeah, and and I think it is one of those albums where if you if you just listen to it a couple times, it may actually grow on you. And so it's you know it's an album that actually again kind of like you I listened to it and I was like, I don't really hate this album that much. Kind of like you said, like I think the first couple four or five tracks they're okay. You know, yeah, and they're not they're, they're not my favorite type of Def Leppard. There's not a lot of heavy riffs in here, but you know, eh. <laughs> as a fan of Rick Allen's drumming, this is the first time. He just got better samples. I wish there was a nicer way to say it, but yeah, if it was any doubt in your mind that dude could play drums, this is where you can forget what you're hearing is someone who's not playing normal drum set. Yeah. And he, it all kind of fits have, together. He might be playing an acoustic set on here sometimes. I know that now he does th that more. I'm not sure how he does it. It must be how it's laid out or something like that. But who knows? Maybe this might just be a bunch of, you know, real drums. It's kind of cool. But for an album that looks so, pardon the pun, extreme, mm -hmm. as simple as it is, this is a laid back Def Leppard. I just, I dig it because it's not embracing 2002, trying to do something different. It's almost like they looked at their peers. You mentioned Bon Jovi earlier. And they kind of did something similar where they just laid back mm -hmm. and did the same thing they were already doing. Yeah, that's true. Hmm. I mean, it's not going to win any awards as like a great metal record or a great rock record necessarily. But uh, but like I said, I, I again, I, I kind of appreciate that whole like, let's try to go a little bit out of the norm. But they also didn't really they didn't really abandon their sound. They just kind of focused on a specific aspect of their sound that they hadn't really expanded out into a full record before. Right. And so you get you get stuff that's a little bit slower. It's a little bit more emotional. And as a hard rock fan, I'm not going to love it. I have to be in a certain mind m mood to listen to it. But uh, for the most part, I think that they did fine. I mean, you know, it's terrible to say and this is what I mean, but I don't think the records necessarily suck. Slang, slang kind of sucks, but uh, <laughs> this one, um, but yeah, mm -hmm. but I mean, yeah, with, with X, it's it's just one of those records that I could I could take it or leave it. It's not that it's going to change my life or anything, but um, it's good to see Def Leppard still doing the damn thing uh, this many years into their career when they absolutely could have stopped releasing albums in the mid nineties yeah. and they could have just toured off of off of their their hits. So for their next album, are you going to the cover album? Uh, 
Uh, do I, have I, to? I like <laughs> this album more than I, I expected to. Are we doing it? If Metal Jesus wants to talk about, yeah, yeah. then we're talking about, <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I thought that you guys might bring this up, so I went ahead and still grabbed it. Uh, this is a hard one to judge because it's not their songs. <laughs> yeah. How, however, it's, um, you know, I'm just to be just to be clear. I typically don't like cover albums. And the reason for that is because one, I usually can make the arguments like I just rather hear the original. You sure. know what I mean? Um, or it's so out there that it's it's not something I'm interested in. Or maybe sometimes the songs are just overplayed. And what I like about this album it's it's 100 cover albums it's all british or it, it, english songwriters yeah and i'm not sick of all the songs on here actually many of them i'd never heard of before and so that that was what's kind of cool about it and also a lot of these i think they make their own and do really interesting things with it so um i mean i love 20th century boy i think their version we've actually played that as a band uh, on stage we'll do the def leppard version their version of rock <laughs> on i think is killer uh, hanging on the telephone. I, d- I had no idea. Actually, was not a Blondie song. It was actually written by a British band, and they were the ones doing the cover of it. I thought that's pretty cool. Yes. Um, the ELO song in here. You know, normally when you're going to do an ELO song, you would do one of the big hits, but they chose to do the overture, mm-hmm. uh, which I thought was really cool. Again, they cover David Bowie, but it's not the song you would normally think of. But the real standout song in this is the last one. Stay with me. Rod so, Stewart, yeah, yeah. So it's it's the faces, obviously sung by Rod Stewart, but that's Phil Collin on on vocals, and he nails the uh, um, the Rod Stewart vocals on that, and the slide guitar on that is killer. So I actually really dig this album. I again because I'm not sick of these songs. It's kind of cool to be introduced to stuff I'm not usually familiar with. So cover albums for me work or they don't work, mm-hmm. and for me that's usually do you play the song the way it's written or do you over embellish it and try to turn it into something that it's not i love listening to a band like power man 5000 do covers because they make it sound like power man 5000 but they don't change the song for me this is a very unique example of a covers album because you have a british band playing british songs it's not just a album of covers that we decided to play this week because we had to meet the record release schedule so for that it is unique and it's cool you know it reminds me of metallica and why i like their covers because often their (laughs) covers are are pretty straight but they're often better than the originals you know or at least metallic eyes right like their version of uh, stone cold crazy yeah, I love that. You know, oh, it's a ten to one better. Yeah. Free speech for the yeah. dead. Yeah. Oh yeah, exactly. They've just got so <laughs> many. I mean, speaking of of Def, or, uh, Metallica, by the way, I'm sure you guys know that that big black album cover album's coming out. That is like anybody and everybody, country stars, rap stars, hip hop, metal, thra- everyone is going to be doing. It. I Ghost is going to be in there. I that's yeah. going to be weird. Well, it's that makes crazy. sense. That does yeah. make a lot of sense. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm. I don't want to say I'm looking forward to it. I probably will like it. Um, I've, yeah. I've become kind of an old softy since we started doing this. Uh, you was I was much more of a metal purist whenever we first started, but um, I'm, I'm excited to hear some of those different interpretations of those songs. Yeah, but it's it's going to be very hit and miss. I, I, I'm curious to hear it, but also too, it might be too much. Do we need 15 versions of Enter Sandman? You know, <laughs> of course we do. <laughs> Of course we do. That's that's what the that's what the people want. Somebody somebody decided that that that's what the people want. Um, and you know, I hate to say it, but people are people are sometimes dumb, and some people that's the only Metallica song that they know. Um, so that's fine. Um, yeah, I'm excited about it. Um, I wasn't as excited about this one just because I, I'm going to be honest with you guys. I didn't know a lot of the songs uh, that were on this one. So like if I didn't know it was a cover album going into it, I would have been like, OK, this was a weird album by Def Leppard. None of the songs mm-hmm. like to go together uh, <laughs> or yeah. any of that. But um, but yeah, it's actually interesting. I So the version of it that I listened to actually had the Japanese bonus track mm-hmm. or had the bonus tracks on it. And so it was actually really cool hearing them play uh, Search and Destroy by the Stooges. <laughs> <laughs> which is something I was just not expecting at all. I just wouldn't have ever thought of like Def Leppard covering Iggy Pop, you know? 
yeah. that was that was different. But uh, but it's Iggy I Pop, it, dude. I think I think at this point in their career, they've earned it though. They've earned a they've earned a cover record. Um, and, it, and don't you think it explains kind of their mentality? Because there's not a lot of metal or hard rock, you know, heavy songs on here. It's a lot of glam rock, 70s. You know what I mean? It, it, so when I heard this, I was like, oh, this is really where they're coming from. This is why so many of their albums sound or go down these roads. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because these are their influences. It's not other stuff. It's not the hard rock, the metal. You know what I mean? There's there's no metal on here at all. You know? Yeah. I mean, yeah, well, there is a little bit. You've got "Don't Believe a Word" by uh, Thin Lizzy. Um, yeah, I'm a big fan of Thin Lizzy. I, I consider her metal, but um, hmm. but uh, but yeah, I, I think that yeah, it's not. It, it does. It shows where they actually come from, and I think a lot of the times, especially with a band like Def Leppard, it's easy to just kind of categorize them as some band that had a big hit back in the day, and and everybody liked them for that five minutes. Um, because I think I think for a lot of metal and hard rock fans, we put a lot of expectations on artists. We decide what we want them to sound like, and then we're disappointed when they don't do the thing that we want. Um, whereas I think this record provides a really good explanation, a, a good historical document of like you have to understand where we come, where we're coming from, <laughs> yeah. you know, in order to, in order to understand why we made the decisions that we made. Uh, it doesn't really explain away like slang, but it does <laughs> explain. Uh, a lot of their early stuff moving on and they, uh, some of the stuff that people think is some of their most classic stuff wasn't necessarily the most like legitimate Def Leppard stuff I think that's that's the interesting thing about Hysteria is it stands out as the band's most iconic album when it doesn't really necessarily sound like the band that put out all the rest of their records hmm. Yeah, it's well I, again I think most people will make the argument that Mutt Lang you know the producer was a, the guy who really molded them in many ways for sure because yeah. when he's not there you can really tell yeah yep and then that's how we get you know songs from the sparkle lounge yeah <laughs> 2008 go is so awesome come on you, do, you know what it's so funny you mentioned that because i woke up the other day with that song in my head you know how sometimes you just wake up with songs in your head mm -hmm. god that song is catchy i know I this wasn't, is not. Go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say this is not again not another solid album, but it's got some great songs on it. The first three songs I think are great. Go, Nine Lives, and Come On, Come On are catchy as all hell. You know. Well, Go is interesting, and, and Nine uh, Nine Lives also is interesting in that like, well, Nine Lives has almost kind of like this like country kind of mm -hmm. sort of vibe to it. Um, but Come On, Come On sounds like classic Def Leppard in my opinion it, or it sounds like something like a cover that they would have did on yeah like it's yeah. oh is that, is that a you know bowie song what you know what i mean it sound, has yeah. that sort of like yeah that kind of hook to it but like go go hits so hard right off the mm -hmm. right off the bat yeah it and does. it's got that modern production so like this is the first time i can think of when i'm listening to def leppard and i hear actual guitar crunch you know yeah. like in, in, in a modern yeah in a modern sort of way uh, and so I, I was really, really on board with that. I'm surprised that that song's not more popular than it is, uh, because this is the kind of thing that, like, if you if they had released this as a single, I would have bought the record just off of that song alone. I'd yeah. have been like, no, these guys are you're like, I'd have been like, Def Leppard's back, boys. Like, let's get in there. Like, this is going <laughs> to be great. Uh, and then the rest of the record, they kind of do what they've been doing. Yeah. Uh, you know, for the last couple of records. But I think it's fine. I mean, at this point, it, if you're a lifelong fan of a band like this, at this point, if they give you anything that sounds heavy or kind of out of the way, like you're like, OK, cool. And you're more willing to accept like kind of everything else that they do because they gave you the thing that you wanted. At least you still have those. You still have those one or two songs that you're going to really, really latch on to. And the rest of the record, you know, you can take it or leave it, but you're still going to rock these songs. These songs are going to still end up in your playlist. They're they're going to be the songs that you go to uh, whenever you want to listen to Def Leppard. And you know, for a re for a band this old, you know, having a, a song from 2008 from this band in your playlist, I mean that that says a lot. You know, this is that weird time in all of our lives, recently post high school, where you're trying to learn or figure out how to be an adult. And I wasn't paying attention to Def Leppard. I was listening to a lot of music, but I didn't know this came out. And then sometime in 2009, 2010, my good friend Aaron Custerer walks up to me and says, number one, I'm going to South America because I get to play guitar for a living now. Second, 
I bought this new album by Def Leppard. And I said, songs from the Sparkle Lounge. If that doesn't sound like a parody of 80s metal, I don't know what does. Well, the cover almost looks like... I'd have to look at the cover again, because uh, I don't have it on vinyl. But uh, isn't it kind of like a, almost like Sgt. Pepper's a little bit, where it's got like a, a It looks like a people? hand-drawn Sgt. Pepper's. Okay. Yeah, it's a cool album cover. I like the name. I mean, the name does sound like, okay... You don't, you don't know what you're going to get on here. It could be a lot of things. Yeah, okay, that definitely is very much like... We yeah. come from the 80s! Yeah. The Mona Lisa up front. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, it, it, another album, I guess, you know, when this came out, I did buy it new. Um, based off of Go, and I, I think I'd heard Come On, Come On. Yeah. And at this point, as a long, lifelong Def Leppard fan, I was kind of getting a little annoyed with them going, guys, you know, longtime fans would like to just hear you rock. Just... Again, make that one album that just kicks my ass from beginning to end. Make ten you know? goes. Yeah. Like yeah. do that. And you know, and as the years have gone on, I've been I've really appreciated bands who do do that. Like, you know, the last Judas Priest album, Firepower, kicks you in the nuts. Oh, oh my God. You know what I mean? It's so yeah, it's so yeah. heavy. How fucking old is Rob Halford these days? It you he, It doesn't matter. His voice doesn't change. It doesn't exactly. matter. Yeah. That album is so fucking awesome. Same also with Megadeth. The Dystopia album was awesome. The yeah. Coffin so, Train by Diamond Head. Oh, really? Yeah, you there's need a new to wave go of first heavy metal listen to that, that right back. now. Yeah, so so I you know so I, I get inspired by bands like that. You know who who can muster it up. Maybe sometimes actually, if we think about it, some of those bands have had other younger members join. So maybe that's the issue is that Def Leppard, you know, Vivian Campbell joined in the mid 90s. And I don't think that they're utilizing him, to be quite honest with you. You know, he's the guitarist from Dio. He was on all his classic Dio albums. And so I don't think they're really using him to his full potential. So anyways, to bring it back to Sparkle Lounge, whatever the hell is called. <laughs> I, I, I like certain songs off it, but I, I do wish it would rock just a tad more, you know? Yeah, no, I feel that. Well... Are we ready, gentlemen? I've got conflicting dates. Is this 2014 or 2015? Uh, no. I want to say 15. It's it's relatively new, isn't it? Yeah, I'm yeah. not going to lie to you guys. I didn't buy it when it came out. Uh, but uh, this is such a weird time in the career to release a self-titled. Yeah. <laughs> um, and can we just talk about the first track on here? It's yeah. ridiculous. Let's like, go. Yeah. You know, I mean, why? When I first put this on, I was like, Guys, you are literally just rewriting Pour Some Sugar on Me. Those are almost the exact same notes. Yep. Yeah. Like, yep. What the hell? Like, it's just, it, it's so, I'm, I'm surprised this even made it past the record label guy. You know, this would be like, name a band just rewriting their most popular hit and hoping nobody notices. Like, what the hell? I mean, Nirvana, a lot of Nirvana songs were like were basically the same. Anyway, um, but uh, sure, sure, yeah. a lot of pop, yeah, obviously the Ramones and stuff like that. But you know what I mean. But it's like again, when you have such an iconic, cool, mega hit like that, and then to almost completely copy it. Now, I do like the chorus of "Let's Go." It actually does stick in my head. It's kind of annoying, but I can't get past that riff. I hate, I hate the fact that they did this. This is freak out all over again how do we write another single guys just play that song we love backwards and it'll be fine <laughs> yeah i know got it perfect print it track one what are we gonna despite, call it well i would say despite the massive amount of self-plagiarism uh that you have with let's go i think the first five songs of this are pretty decent um and like with them calling it self-titled def leopard it makes sense like yeah we're gonna sound like def leopard you know and and the thing that struck me the most too, uh, and it could just be the nostalgic feelings of listening to Let's Go, is it a rip, self rip off or is it a throwback? You know, th there's a lot of ways to interpret that. And I think that one of the biggest things is that that struck me because so I did this discography a little bit different than I normally do. Usually I'll start on the first record and move my way on. With Def Leppard, I started with this album and I went backwards. Hmm. Uh, and I was struck immediately by how much they sound like classic Def Leppard uh, in 2015. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and of course, as I went through, I realized that they had changed throughout, you know, because I was like, oh, God, am I about to listen to 11 of the same album? You know, um, but I found it very, very notable that his voice sounds the same. 
it is still just as powerful as it was in the 80s. And I don't know a lot of vocalists that have been in the game this long that, that can do that. I mean, I think I think it's because they tour. They've always toured for sure. Yeah. He's always kept it up. He's taking care of himself, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and this is also a band that didn't just get, totally get destroyed with the excess of their popularity. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, it sounds to me like they're they recognize something that a lot of bands that came out at the same time that they did didn't realize that this was going to be their living. This is what they were going to do for the rest of their lives. This was their career. Um, and they they reached, you know, critical mass very early on in their career. But they've they've maintained it in a way that I'm very uh, I'm just flabbergasted by. Like they've 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 kept it amazingly consistent mm-hmm. for the t- for where they came from and and where they're at now. Whereas if you buy a new Def Leppard record, I can't imagine a lifetime fan listening to this record and being like mad or upset with it. I don't think it's it's reinventing the wheel, but I don't think that's the goal either. I don't think that every band has to be innovative uh, in order to be good. I mean, a lot of my favorite bands, uh, all their records sound the same. You can ask Joe. You know, like they're it's all. Uh, very similar stuff. I can't claim to be a Slayer fan uh, and then get mad at Def Leppard for keeping a, a consistent sound, you know, throughout, <laughs> throughout their career. Um, or ACDC or, you know. Yeah, or yeah. Accept or, yeah, like yeah. any of these bands uh, or even Kiss, you know. Yeah. Um, these guys realize after a while that like, hey, yeah, we're not playing out the sold out arenas that we're playing. You know, they're thinking this in the 90s because now they could go play a sold out arena any anytime they want. And um, they do. And they do, yeah. you know. Uh, and so it, it's really a, a great lesson in just kind of staying on the path, I guess, so to speak. Um, and so, like, I, I, that's that's really what I got out of this record because it was kind of my first, it was my first jump in back into Def Leppard. And from that perspective, I was like, this is actually amazingly consistent. It's not, it's not going to win my like favorite record of all time award, or it, it's not going to be as good as as Hysteria or even Pyromania, which I think is probably their best in my opinion um but honestly this is this is this is par for the course and it's fine it's a little long which is something i think they have problems with Mm -hmm. um i actually really like the album closer blind faith um it's weird too that almost has like a little bit of like grunge sound to it uh at the end and so it was kind of cool hearing them kind of have a little bit more of a modern influence but it not be done in like an obviously like catering sort of way because uh, now it's 2015, you know nobody nobody plays grunge anymore. So like it's fine, <laughs> you can you you can go in and do that sort of thing. So um, yeah, overall, I, I thought this one was fine. I didn't really have any issues with it, and I was kind of I was actually kind of impressed with it. It places. Hmm. Yeah, I think for me, you know, I, I bought this, and again, I just I'd love for them to just put a little bit more energy, a little more time into the guitars, the riffs, just. To, Maybe again, bring back the the dream team of Mutt Lang or somebody like that who can kind of hone this down to just you know ten or twelve amazing songs. I think that they've got it in them. You can see moments of it in all of these albums, these later albums here. So uh, again, an album I didn't hate, but also too, it was like uh, I'm still waiting for that one album. Come on, Def Leppard, come on, give it to me, you know. <laughs> I'm listening sure. to this thinking this is modern Def Leppard. Okay, but mm. I'm with you. There's another hysteria in there. I don't know if Pyromania is in there, but there's another hysteria in there. I agree. <laughs> It'd be nice. But they, they they keep putting out cool stuff though. So you know that's what I like about about Def Leppard is that they're really good about going back into their past and releasing special editions of these albums and and uh, you know like just even just a couple of weeks ago. My last album here, they released this. So a 1980s oh, yeah. bootleg of this is back with their original guitarist playing those classic early, early songs. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so, again, if Def Leppard is putting out this, they know that fans want, you know, they want to bring oh, some yeah. of this stuff back. So I don't well, know. That's something we didn't get that. into either is the amount of re-releases, the amount of like cool stuff that they've just dropped over the years. You know, there's multiple, obviously multiple greatest hits, tons of live albums, you know, so this much is, box sets. Yeah. yeah. This is really cool because we were talking about hysteria where they were trying to release all of the, al- or, uh, the entire album as singles. Well, what they did was they divided the, the album into nine sections. And so oh. each one of them makes out a section. And so you can actually build up 
the the album cover with the 45s. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, so they all kind of fit together. That so, is cool. That's it why is. you buy two of them, right? You do one to frame and then the other to, to yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, so anyways, I, I know I... I was expecting a bunch of cassettes to come out of that box. Like, here's track one. (laughs) Here's track two. (laughs) Oh, yeah. 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 We did it. Yeah. Def Leppard's fun to talk about for sure. I was looking forward to this. They're one of those bands where, again, it's a roller coaster a little bit. You love some of it. You you don't love some of it. You know, it's it's, it's fun to talk about a band like that, you know, and kind of get into the minutia of all that. Yeah. Well, and I appreciate you coming on and helping because I know, like, when we first started talking about doing Def Leppard on the show, uh, I was a little bit, um, I mean, I almost vetoed it because I was like, ah, I don't know, man. I don't know if it's something that I'm going to want to listen to or, or go all the way through and and all of that. But like having you on here was was great because I was like, I don't know what I'm going to talk about necessarily. And, I, and I'm afraid that I'm going to like, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm afraid that I'm going to say something wrong or something horribly misinformed or, or something like that. Um, and so it, it, it's always helpful to have a super fan uh, on on board because I can tell you the episodes where we've just tried to get through it on our own and maybe I say something dumb, man, the super fans come out of the woodwork then. Uh, let me tell you. <laughs> well, the super fans are going to come out with the Def Leppard because if you talk bad about them in any way, <laughs> I think if I'm the one who's supposed to be the defender of Def Leppard, some people might be somewhat disappointed. But I feel like I'm a realistic fan for sure. I think it's going to be you and I have kind of chatted behind the scenes a little bit about doing a Kiss, yeah, uh, episode. And Kiss will be very similar to that. I think you'll probably like it more because they are more rock, they are more metal. They are, yeah. And also, too, I'm I'm dying to know what you think about their grunge album. Okay, I dude. haven't heard it, but I will. Oh, dude, have to dude. To you're it. in dude. for they, a surprise. They released <laughs> they released an album. Uh, well, it, it was actually. It, it wasn't officially they, they almost killed it but it's called carnival of souls if you want to hear kiss basically writing original songs in the style of allison chains mm-hmm. check it out it's it's crazy <laughs> and you were worried about the disco record <laughs> yeah, yeah i know. was worried do, about the disco do, record they do disco and they do grunge full-on grunge buddy you're gonna and actually the, the irony is i kind of like it so well, but I've got it saved to my Spotify. So yeah, I'll, uh, I'm dying to know what you think about that. It'll be okay. pretty interesting. That's well, that, that'll be a to be continued uh, for yeah. sure. Uh, but yeah, so well, this is this is the part of the show where we kind of uh, take everything we talked about and we wrap it up into a nice little bow. Um, what are your final thoughts on Def Leppard? Me? Yeah. You know, I'm still a super fan, man. It's one of those bands where uh, you know their hysteria is is on the back wall here. It's one of my go-to albums from the 80s. I still love it today. I still actually listen to a lot of Def Leppard, probably more than my wife would really like. <laughs> <laughs> I can relate to that. But uh, I'm also, they're the kind of band too where, you know, a new release comes out and I get, I become that kid again where I'm like, ooh, new Def Leppard's coming out. I'm excited for that, you know? <laughs> so, um, you know, I'm, I'm lifelong, man. I'm, I'm all in, you know, just again, just a couple weeks ago, going to record store day, buying the, uh, the new live bootleg. So they're just one of those bands where I think that they're, they've stood the test of time for a reasons because people can connect with them. They write decent songs. Um, they're a good time and they, they put on a fantastic live show. They did not disappoint when I saw them. So, um, yeah, I, I, I like them. They're cool. Damn. What about you? Well, you know, this has been kind of an experience for me. I, this is a band I went into just being pretty sure I was going to hate all of it and that I was going to be like, oh, this is terrible. But as I've gotten older, I've just kind of like, I mean, after a while, man, it gets really tired of listening. I get really tired of listening to records that are like intentionally um, intentionally produced badly uh, because everybody's got some sort of thing that they're trying to prove to everybody else. Um, and it gets, I get tired of just straight blasting all the time. It's not that I don't love that stuff, but I, I, it is nice to kind of go into, go into a slightly different direction. So I think in that, in that regard, Def Leppard really is cool. And I think that they've got a, they've got a, um, they've got a history that I think you, you can kind of look at when you're trying to figure out why metal got popular in the eighties. And it's not that they were like some sort of like front runner metal band or anything that they were like playing 15 minute solos or, or doing anything crazy. 
Um, but I think that I think that they, you know, like, like we were talking about at the beginning of the episode, you know, you hear a Def Leppard song on um, on top 40, you know, and you're like, wow, this is a lot different than what I th- than what I've heard before. And I think stuff like that is largely responsible for why metal is so accepted now uh, as a style, you know, and even that's been relatively recently. Uh, that people have started to kind of accept metal as this thing that's not going to go away. That it was not something that just existed in the '80s, um, and I also think that it's really cool how they kind of persevered through all the all the changes. You know, yeah, we made fun of a couple of records for trying to be you know trendy or or, or whatever, but for the most part, though, like these guys kind of stuck to kind of what they do uh, really well, and uh, and for that, I, I salute them. So I think if you if you want some good history on like on rock and, and metal that's like that that's responsible for kind of bringing that more into the mainstream i think def leppard's a good place to start def leppard wrote the book on how to write a heavy metal pop song <laughs> yeah they are the band that i look to when i'm trying to explain why everyone loved 80s metal so much there was a time in our musical culture where It was about being heavy, but it was about being cool at the same time. And there's a point in there where someone just got whatever was missing and said, that's going to be on the radio. That's going to be the next big thing. And Def Leppard is just really good at writing songs. That's something that always comes back whenever you look at musical trends, no matter what the style. If it's the 60s, it's the 70s, 80s, all the way to 2021, somebody is going to come along and write good songs. And Def Leppard might be one of the best because everybody looks to them and says, nobody can write a song like Def Leppard. So you're listening to Def Leppard today, unless you're ignoring every piece of radio that's ever been put in front of you. So I don't have to tell you to go listen to Def Leppard, but I want you to. I want you to listen to the songs that you haven't heard because the hits are there, but there's so much more. And that is what I have to say about Def Leppard this week. Yeah, the speaking of which, and I mentioned a little bit earlier that they have two greatest hits releases. And the one that's really fun to listen to is volume two for that very reason, that if you're if you're sick of hearing the, the pour some sugar on me and that sort of stuff, Listen to volume two, because I think you'll be surprised at the stuff that you might have missed the first time around, because it's pretty catchy. It's, it's, there's a lot of gems in there for sure. Dan, what's your album of the week? Well, you know, I, w- I was going through my through my Spotify and I was like, what have I been listening to this week? And it was like Def Leppard, Def Leppard, Def Leppard, Def Leppard, Def Leppard. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I did I did sneak a couple of listens to He Is Legends, uh, Suck Out the Poison. Uh a few times in there because I just needed to kind of I, I tend to I tend to try to palate cleanse whenever I'm doing stuff like this because you run the risk of like listening to listening to one band for an entire week you run the risk of just getting sick of it and hating it and then unfairly criticizing it because you're sick of it you know um, whereas these are records that were released years apart you know so that was my palate cleanser this week was was some he is legend so uh, it, it was like the opposite of death Def Leppard. It was like gritty and dingy and just like sounds like it was recorded in a dungeon. Yeah. <laughs> Metal Jesus, what about you? I forgot that we do this. So I'm I'm glad that you spoke first. So <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so I, I'll, I'll do two. Are we allowed to do two? You can do whatever you want, man. Okay. All right. The first one is Van Weezer by Weezer. Oh yeah, yeah. So this is this is Van. It kind of goes in 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 line with uh, Def Leppard a little bit. So it's their tribute to '80s hard rock and melodic. Um, not metal, but rock. And so it's their latest v- Weezer album came out probably about a month ago, so ago, and it's got solos in it. And it's got riffs. They do a, a version of kind of a, a crazy train by Ozzy in there, but they kind of mix up and make their own version. It's super catchy. It's a typical Weezer. I, I mean, I'm liking it way more than I probably should. Um, and the other album is completely different from that and that is the new liquid tension experiment album so that's the there's another one yeah there's there's three they just put out their third one 21 years later (laughs) so if you're not familiar with liquid tension experiment it's basically mike portnoy of dream theater it's got uh john petrucci of dream theater and jordan rudis 
And also Tony Levin, he's a bass player. He's very famous, played with Peter Gabriel and John Lennon. And it's all instrumental, crazy prog rock music. There's no vocals and it's kind of insanity. It's it's really cool, progressive rock, all instrumental. Um, but it was it's a really important album because it does reunite Mike Portnoy, who has not been with Dream Theater for 10 years, with uh, you know the other two main songwriters in it, so it, it's kind of it's it's really cool to hear. It definitely, so definitely is sparking some questions. It is, and actually, even more so because the other thing that Mike Portnoy did was he played on John Petrucci's solo album this year as well. So that's I, I still think that Mike Portnoy is happy where he is. I don't think he's going to come back to Dream Theater anytime soon. Uh, I don't think he necessarily even needs to, as much as I I love his style playing and stuff and the energy he brings to Def Leppard. But but in the meantime, we do have Liquid Tension Experiment Three, and it's fantastic. It's it's awesome. I know what I'm listening to tonight after this recording. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're going to love it, dude. It's it's killer. That's hilarious. Um, I'll have to check that out. I, I've, I've always been kind of on the on the fringes when it comes to the Dream Theater stuff and the Dream Theater members. Uh, but Joe got me to listen to it and he got me to admit that there was records that, that there were records that were really good. Uh, that was such a that that episode was such an ebb and flow between like me being like, "What are you guys talking about?" and then being like, <laughs> and, then, and then being like, "No, it's amazing," and here's why. You know. Didn't you have to record that twice? Is yes. that, do I remember that right? Yeah. We had to record the second <laughs> half of it twice. Yeah. Because, yeah. Uh, yeah. The computer failed in the middle of the yeah. first one. And I remember calling, we, we had a guest, uh, John Drake, uh, who he does a, star, a really, really great Star Wars podcast called the Nerf Herder Console. And uh, they were, and yeah, so we had him on and we talked, for, I mean, we must talk for like three hours or something. And then we were like, uh, well, I had to call him back two weeks later and be like, hey, we lost half the recording. So, you're gonna have to come back, and <laughs> we're gonna do like the other, the other yeah. half. And thankfully, he did it right. Um, and uh, yeah, and it was it was really funny because he's like, we we got done, and he was like, yeah, it pretty much went exactly the way that it did last time. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, well, I don't remember, so <laughs> uh, hopefully it was good. But uh, Metal Jesus, thank you so much, man. This was this was absolutely a blast, and it was great, kind of just getting to see your passion for the band and and, and your enjoyment. I think that's. That's the most fun part about what we do here is, is seeing people really kind of come alive with music and 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 to see what um, what makes people what makes people tick, so to speak. Mm-hmm. So it's super cool, and um, yeah, I think uh, is, are are we done? Did we do this? Hey Dan, by the way, my album of the week is Doctor Feel Good by Motley Crue. Oh cool. Hey Joe, oh. what's your album of the week, Joe? <laughs> you mentioned in the very beginning. Okay, so so oh, interesting. Okay. It's becoming obvious to me that this podcast is going to be dipping into some sweet 80s metal from time to time. So why not listen to Motley Crue? Because we're talking about the 80s, right? Yes. I saw, I saw Motley Crue on that tour and oh my God, Jealousy. they were, it was, yeah, it was, I mean, they had, they had the stripper pole dancers up there and, you know, Tommy Lee with his, with his drum kit and, you know, flying over the crowd with his plane oh my god it was it was awesome i hear the final <laughs> tour they did i think it was two or three years ago maybe even before that he finally got his roller coaster drum set hmm. and i hear uh, it failed on the last night oh really so there you go <laughs> some things weren't designed to go together yeah you know uh speaking of molly crew do you follow the whole thing with vince neal and the singer i he's 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 not quite the the amazing singer he used to be. Unfortunately, it's it's kind of sad. So, because I'm a huge Molly Crew fan, and I'd love to see them. I think they're going to do one more tour. They they weren't supposed to, but because they signed a document, yeah. And so, I don't know. But anyways, yeah. Yeah, I've heard I've heard a couple of people. Um, if you read any of the metal news sites or whatever. For some reason, when people when podcasters have been interviewing people, they're like, "So how do you think he's going to do uh, on this tour?" And then, of course, the person will give their ex- their their honest answer, and then they'll make a headline out of it. Uh, yeah. But uh, but yeah, I think that I, I think he's going to 
I think it's understandable that somebody's not going to be able to perform at the highest level whenever they reach a certain age either. And I'm not going to get into whether or not it's because he's let himself go or hasn't let himself. I'm, I'm not going to be the guy that's like, well, you really let yourself go um, or anything like that. But I do think that um, I think the fans are going to be there for it. And I, I think it's going to be fine. Um, but you just can't have the same expectations of people, you know, from 40 years ago. I think that's unless it's Rob Helford. That's true. You know, and I think <laughs> after of, of watching a bunch of Molly Crew live performances, it seems like they're performing them in the same key that they originally wrote them in, which, you know, for any singer from the 80s, that is pretty hard to pull off when you're getting older. It's just almost impossible, unless you're Rob Halford, right? <laughs> and even well, Rob Halford's an ex- exception to the rule, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, but I, I think even Iron Maiden plays some of their songs in a slightly lower key. I could be wrong about that, but it wouldn't, su- wouldn't surprise me. And again, it's completely acceptable, you know, I mean, so. Bruce still hits the notes on the old stuff pretty well. Um, right. But, but I'm wondering if it's in the same key, because, again, it would be, int- you know, usually most bands want to lower the key a little bit just so it's a little bit easier for their singer. Sure. You know? Yeah, that um, makes sense. I, have to, I, have to look. I wasn't looking for it the last time I watched yeah. an Iron Maiden video, but. And, and honestly, most most audience members don't even know, you know, it's they like wouldn't, yeah. exactly that you would never know. So make it easier for them, you know, but yeah, they're know. stoked. There's a 20 foot Eddie on the stage. Yeah. It's, yeah. You know, it's fine. Yeah. Um, but yeah, super cool with well, this is, uh, I can't wait to, uh, I can't wait for people to, to hear this. I think it's, uh, it's a little different. It's out of our comfort zone and I kind of like it. So. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me on. This is a lot of fun. So, thanks for hanging. Awesome. Is anything cool coming out that we need to know about? Um, boy, you know, the only thing that's really kind of new in my world is that the world is opening up again, which is really awesome because I used to spend so much time going to retro gaming expos. And that was, you know, some of the my favorite parts of YouTube and video game hunting. So um, I'm really excited to be traveling again. So at least uh, this year, I'm going to be going to Connecticut, I think, Hartford, Connecticut, something like that. Um, that's going to be one of them that's going to be announced. So I'm going to be going over to the East Coast in November and maybe some other stuff in October or sooner. So we'll see. It'll be interesting. Yeah. I'm excited to get back on the road and, and see people again. It's going to be awesome. Same. We're hoping, uh, we're hoping to go out and do some, you know, I've made so many friends doing the podcast and, uh, I never get to see any of them in real life. So I think it was just a couple of weeks ago. I actually took a three hour trip to go, just go visit somebody that we'd had as a guest on the show. We sat down, had some beers, had lunch. It was, it was great. So I'm hoping, hoping to get to do some more stuff like that coming up. Well, if you guys ever come to Seattle area, I got a place right here. We'll do the podcast live. 100%. <laughs> or at least in the same room. So it'll be awesome. There you go. Yeah, we won't have to stand. <laughs> we're totally all here, but we're in separate rooms, separate compartments. <laughs> hey, Dan, what'd you think up. about this one? Yeah. I thought it was great. Yeah. Awesome. Well, guys, thank you so much for checking out this episode. We will have more for you in the future. Stay metal. And that was our chat with Metal Jesus all about Def Leppard. Dude, that was so much fun. Dude knows so much more about Def Leppard than I will ever know. And I love the fact that he did my job for me halfway through. If you guys were watching the video, uh, he had the vinyl covers just up there. He just pulled them out and we're like, well, I'm not going to keep throwing cover artwork up on here if (laughs) if I've got somebody else doing it for me. So uh, hats off to you, my friend. Uh, Metal Jesus is always a pro. He always knows what he's talking about, and he's a great guitarist, great YouTuber. Check him out if you haven't heard him before um, or seen him. He's he's one of the best gaming YouTubers uh, out there, and uh, his record collection is one that I am personally very jealous of, uh, as well as his game collection. But uh, that wraps it up for this episode, guys. You know, there's a lot of different ways that you guys can reach out to us to let us know what bands you want us to talk about. That's kind of a mouthful, but I think you guys are following me here. So you can send us an email at danandjoeshow at gmail.com. You can tweet at us at Discuss Metal. You can follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash discography discussion. You can find us on Instagram also at Discuss Metal. You can join our Discord server. Discord is the place to be right now. Everybody's hanging out on Discord. We're sharing memes. We're discussing metal. We're discussing life in general. And uh, Discord's kind of your first place to check for news about the podcast. It's kind of cutting edge over there. So in the in the show notes for this episode, there's going to be a link to our Discord server. You can click on that link and you will be invited to the wonderful world of Discord. If you would like some sweet discography discussion merch, you can head over to our Teespring store. There will be a link in the show notes for that. This is your last opportunity to check out the old discography discussion logo because we've got some new ones coming up. 
and there's going to be some more awesome merch with the new logo on it whenever we get it done we'll show it to you sometime and on that note this has been episode 232 of discography discussion thank you for listening you can like us on facebook and follow us on twitter at discuss metal subscribe to our podcast everywhere you listen to podcasts including google play apple podcasts and stitcher Visit DiscussMetal.com for all things discography discussion. And please send questions and comments to Dan and Joe Show at gmail.com. If you are not a patron, you can become one at Patreon.com forward slash Discuss Metal. We have some sweet perks. Hey, Joe, can I borrow some money? $1 a month gets you into that exclusive album review feed. 